Talk Shoe. Recorded live. Oh, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But the Truth. It's January the 19th, 2015. And that, uh, York, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Good. It's a little bit of a shame that Tom wouldn't join us up to now. He hasn't logged into Skype, so I didn't see him yet. And I always appreciate, of course, his comments when I do the reading on the characteristics of Antichrist, but uh, we can also go on with the two people that we are here and the few that are listening to us in the chat room for what my thanks that they are coming to listen live to our broadcast here and uh, their support they give us on that. So without any further ado, I will go to uh, point number 19 of the 26 characteristics of Antichrist that can be found on the web page uh, from uh, Nicholas von Gremlin.org. We already discussed the first 18. Last week we uh, managed to go through one point in two hours or something because it was very extensive. So we will see how it's, uh, how, uh, where the journey will take us today. We will start with characteristic number 19, which says that Antichrist uh, is a Christian church mixed with Babylon. The Antichrist must be a Christian church <coughs> that embraces the teachings of Babylon. Revelation 17 verse 5 says, quote, and upon the forehead was uh, a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, end quote. In the scriptures we find the prophetic explanation of the church of Antichrist. We learned earlier that a woman in prophecy equals a church. A mother is most definitely a woman, is she not? Therefore, this mother in Revelation 17 verse 5 is a church. Problem is, this mother is a whore. In fact, she is a mother of many whores, the prophecy says. This means that many churches the world over will spawn out from this church doing as she taught. Looking through history, we will find upwards of 3,000 different denominations that have been spawned from Roman Catholicism. Prophecy defines this woman as a whore. This means she will be an apostate mother or church to all those that do as she suggests. Um, just a little bit more explanation to this point that he's given here. Um, Tony Palmer said the same thing when he was in this meeting with Kenneth Copeland some time ago, where he said, Luther's protest is over, as yours, um, that the result of the Protestant Reformation was that the church, the mother church, what they call the Roman Catholic Church, split up through the years in 3,000 different denominations. And um, they call that division. Well, to me, actually, there's only a reason for two churches, namely the real church of Jesus Christ and, of course, this fake church of Babylon that we are talking about here, which is uh, the mother of all, <clears throat> the mother of harlots and abominations in the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, the world would be better if we could scrap that one and only would have the Church of Christ, of course, in our life by fear. That's, that's not the way it happens. But what happens is that through the ecumenical movement um, that started really some years ago, uh, the latest, uh, it got in another year with Vatican II in the 60s of the last century, um, all these uh, daughters of the mother harlot come back under her wings. That's exactly what's going to happen. For example, uh, with the treaty that was signed of the Lutheran worldwide denomination in 1999, with, uh, which she signed with the Roman Catholic Church, that they went back under the wings of the Mother Heart. So I continue reading now. All throughout the world. Of hey, your, your, yes. Before you, yeah. What page are you on? I'm trying to find it, and I am having a hard time, so... Uh, in the PDF, it's uh, page 74. It's uh, 74, okay. Characteristic number 19. All right, my apologies. No, no problem. All throughout the word of God, we see an apostate church being likened unto a harlot. In Jeremiah 3, verse 6, it says, quote, The Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah the king, Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there has played the harlot. End quote. Israel is the bride of Christ, but the word shows that she seeks another husbandman. 
Doing so means she cheated on her husband. To put it plainly, she, quote-unquote, played the harlot. Sad fact is, she is still doing so to this day. The pagans of Babylon would perform worship to idols under green trees. This practice found its way into the lives of God and chosen people. Soon Israel itself was embracing pagan rituals as well. We all know the same Israel is in fact the loving name of the Father has given to his church. This is not just for the Jewish believers that accept the Lord Jesus as Christ. This name Israel is also for the Gentile believers, believer, for it is well known our Father is not a respecter of persons, and it is also penned in uh, Romans 9, uh, verses 6 through 8, quote, Not as though the word of God has taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. End quote. Um, just an interesting point that I want to go back to. Uh, I was reading here, um, the pagans of Babylon would perform worship to idols and the green trees. Now, this is very significant because I just saw a video from Nick Arthur from Cross the Border, and you are very familiar with him, Michael, because you also do shows with Nick Arthur here. And Nick Arthur is, of course, familiar with Tom Fress from Frostman and Radio since years. And I watched a video of him uh, a day or two ago where he stated that um, under the Jordan auspice, the Temple Mount... Uh, will there will be built a house of worship for the Jews who are not allowed right now to worship on the Temple Mount. And this would be the first step to rebuilding that temple that we are talking about so long. This is, of course, in fulfillment of the counterfeit 70th week of Daniel, which we were talking about in other places. But what strikes me when reading this is to worship idols under green trees. And that is exactly what Nicholas Arthur read from that article that dealt with that uh, subject of the Jews giving allowance to worship again on the Temple Mount, that there were planted trees on the outside and the Jews could perform their worship there under the trees. Hmm. Isn't it great that you can find that even already in the pagans of Babylon that was formed to worship idols on their green trees and now they do the same with the Jews on Mount Moriah? On hmm. Temple Mount? Well, is there any surprise in it all, really? <laughs> no, but, but you can see how history repeats itself. Oh, yeah. In their wrong fulfillment of, uh, of Daniel 70's week again. <clears throat> and I, I, I just find that fascinating to see this, that, that that already has been done before in Babylon. And that the Jews are now invited to go on Temple Mount to worship on the site where the new temple will be built under trees that plant there. Hmm. So, just a thought of mine here. I'm going to continue reading. Okay. There's one more defining feature of this church that I would like to bring to your attention. We already understand it to be a whore, but what type of whoredom does she commit? The prophecy states this would be a church that embraces the teaching of Babylon. Could it be? The church that claims Jesus Christ Lord is also a church that embraces Babylonian or pagan worship? The Lord God, who is a God of divine <clears throat> order, gives us many identifiable facts that point to this very church. So many that it so many that it makes the over, uh, it overwhelmingly easy for the child of God that trusts their Heavenly Father and His Word to see plainly. Please understand, this is a major key in identifying the Church of Antichrist. For if you do not trust your Creator or His Word, then it may be you this passage describes as one, of the embraces, uh, of one who embraces the flesh over and above the Spirit. For it is written well in, one, in 1 Corinthians uh, Chapter 2, verse 14, quote, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, 
for they are foolishness unto them, unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. End quote. What I'm about to share with you is a list of documented admissions of the Roman Catholic Church proving its overwhelming connection to Babylon. Then afterwards, I have a rather extensive list of facts regarding dogmatic as well as ritualistic beliefs found in uh, both Roman Catholicism and Babylonian of old. I have also a flash animation on the website that shows numerous pictures of archaeological findings regarding ancient Babylon of their beliefs, statues, rituals, and day-by-day -day activities that have an uncanny resemblance to things you can find in pictures of the Roman Catholic Vatican and all their churches. This flash animation is about an hour long. It has blessed many since I, <clears throat> since I was blessed with the opportunity to create it. In fact, numerous websites carry this animation on their sites as well. It's in the flash animations of prophecy in the index section of the main page. Or you can find it in the Horror of Babylon flash link in the index, in the prophecy section of the website. I know it's an hour long, but I built a menu within it <clears throat> to allow you to stop and start the animation at any section. Now, on with the Roman Catholic admissions. They honestly admit they do as Babylon taught in writing. Such arrogance. Now follows a quote from an essay on the development of the Christian doctrine from John Henry, Cardinal Newman, page 359. Quote, Cardinal Newman admits in his book that the use of the temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense lamps, uh, incense lamps and candles, votive offerings and recovery from illness, holy water, asylums, holy days and seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the field, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring and marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, the ecclesiastical chant and the Kyrie Eliason are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church, the Roman Catholic Church, that is, end quote. Stopping here for a moment to clarify the fact that the Lord would never allow his people to sanctify the rituals, idols, or doctrines of pagans, we see the Lord stating plainly in, quote, When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land, take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed for, from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God. For every abomination to the Lord which he has, have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. End quote. That is from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 12, verses 29 through 32. Rome not only embraces the idol worship of the pagan nations, they actually admit it. Quote, Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long hold ye between two opinions? If the Lord be good, follow him. Uh, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. End quote. That is from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21. How can anyone claim to sanctify anything the Lord said in the first place should be left behind is amazing to me. Continuing, we find the penetration of the religion of Babylon became so general and well known that Rome was called the New Babylon. This is a quote from Faith of Our Fathers, 1917, edited by Cardinal Gibbons, page 106. And another quote coming from um, Development of Christian Doctrine, Cardinal Newman, page 372, reads, quote, Confiding then in the power of Christianity to resist the infection of evil and to transmute the instruments and appendages of demon worship to an evangelical use, the rulers of the church from early times were prepared, should occasion rise, to adopt or imitate or sanction the existing rites and customs, 
of the pagan populace, end quote. Cardinal Newman lists many examples of things of quote-unquote pagan origin, which the papacy brought into the church, <clears throat> quote, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen. He stated, quote, in order to recommend the new religion to the heathen, uh, the use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints and ornamented in, on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps, and candles, holy water, asylums, means hermitages, monasteries, and convents, pagan holy days, processions, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring and marriage, turning to the east images, and the Kyrie Eliason, end quote. Another quote follows here. The Catholic Church took the pagan philosophy and made it the butler of faith, of faith against the heathen. She took the pagan Roman pantheon, temple of all the gods, and made it sacred to all the martyrs. So it stands to this day. She took the pagan Sunday and made it the Christian Sunday. She took the pagan Easter and made it the feast we celebrate during this season. The sun was a foremost god with heaven doom, with even doom, even doom, sorry. The sun has worshippers at his hour in Persia and other lands. Hence, the church would seem to say, quote, keep that old pagan name, Sunday. It shall remain consecrated and sanctified, end quote. And thus, the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Balder, became the Christian Sunday sacred to Jesus, end quote, from William L. Gaudia, Pasquale Gaudium, in the Catholic World, uh, number 58, March 1894. Another quote from A.C. Flick, The Rise of the Medieval Church, 1909, edition, uh, and the page 148 reads, quote, The mighty Catholic Church was little more than the Roman Empire baptized, end quote. I think this is a very significant statement that he makes there. The Roman Empire baptized. Yeah, it's like Pope Francis has gone baptized right now in the storm in the Philippines, right? This punch you on? Yeah, sure did. <laughs> so it's fine. I still find that hilarious that uh, the little god man ran away from some rain. Yeah. Left, left his followers there. <laughs> yeah, love, love the little video we made on that. So, From ancient Babylon came the cult of the virgin mother goddess who was worshipped as the highest of gods. See uh, Ace H. Langdon, Semitic Mythology, 1931 edition. This worship was taken over as Mary worship by Rome. Even sun worship on Sunday was likewise adopted by the Roman apostasy. Quote, In order to attach to Christianity great attraction in the eyes of the nobility, the priests adopted the outer garments and adornments which were used in pagan cults. End quote. From Life of Constantine, Eusebius, cited in Altai Nimalaya, page 94. And another quote reads, the church did everything it could to stamp out such pagan rites, but had to be, but had to capitulate and allow the rites to continue with only the name and the local deity changed to some Christian saint's name. End quote. And that comes from the religious tradition and this Dr. Edwin uh, Goodenow, professor of religion at Harvard University. Okay, Harvard University, we all know what that's all about. Uh, and the following quote reads, from the foregoing, which treats merely of the more important solar festivals, it is clear that these products of paganism are as much in force as present, as they ever were, and that Christianity countenance, and in many cases has actually adopted and practiced pagan rites, whose even significance is merely lost sight of because attention is not called to the source uh, whence these rites have sprung. So heavy was this infiltration that Sir, Daniel, Sir Samuel Dill exclaims, quote, Christianity is only a sect of the Mithraists, end quote. And this comes from the Roman society from Nero to Marcus Aurelius, page 7. Christianity is only a sect of the Mithraists. Well, this quote, of course, you can only use when you identify Christianity with the Roman Catholic Church because they claim to stand for Christianity and not real Christianity. So please keep that in mind that when Christianity here is used, 
it is linked to the Roman Catholic Church, not to real Christians like the ones here in the chat room and uh, doing this broadcast. Right. Actually, yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, Actually, it would be far more accurate if he said Catholicism is only a sect of the mysteries. <laughs> Sorry, he says it. Nicholas says it right there in the next, uh, in, in the next uh, paragraph. <laughs> Christ, it's, 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 it's true. Point, you know? <laughs> it's, it's true. It shows, it shows once again that, um, that we are right when we are doing these readings and that our intentions are right and that our understanding is right from even from before that we read the text. Right, Michael? <laughs> it gives a little bit of confirmation that we walk in the spirit. Well, I, I get caught all the time doing it as well, so don't feel bad about it. I, <laughs> readings on the show, and I start commenting, then uh, a paragraph later that the, the, uh, the, you know, the author of the article says the same thing that I said. It's the same thing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it still sometimes amazes me, you know. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> The true remnant Christians of today would never do such things as this. As Revelation chapter 14 verse 4 puts it, the true church of Christ is not defiled by these women or churches. Quote, we know that Mithraism was a state religion of Rome at the time that the Christian church was established there. Evidently, tenets of Mithraism, such as Sunday worship and eating the wafer and the mass, were adopted into Christianity at that time. End quote. From Jim Arabito, 666 and the Mark. In Stanley's History, page 40, we read, quote, The popes filled the place of the vacant emperors at Rome, inheriting their power, their prestige, and their titles from paganism. End quote. The next quote comes from Some Law of All Ages, Alcott, page 248. In short, sun worship, symbolically speaking, lies at the very heart of the great festivals which the Christian Church celebrates today. And these relics of heathen religion have, religion have through the medium of their sacred rites, curiously enough blended with practices and beliefs utterly antagonistic to the spirit which prompted them. End quote. The next quote comes from The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly P. Hall. And even though that has nothing to do with this broadcast here, I started reading that book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. It's a very, very long, thick book. It's very tedious, too, to read it. And it's so Anybody who wants to choose to read that book could I bless them. But I've tried. I got the book as well. And it's, uh, yeah. it's so hard to read, you know? Yes. But, yes. but the quotes that you sometimes find in there, almost hidden in there, because you have to read all the stuff to see these quotes. I mean, he did a, he did a monumental work on Freemasonry on there and the understanding of sun worship and all the stuff that we are talking about here. But if you have the chance, get the book. You can get it online. You can um, rather buy it or you can even download it as a PDF, as I did and try to read it, but uh, after an hour, you are absolutely mind-exhausted reading it. I can well, sure. It's, 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 I mean, it's a scholarly work that uh, is epic in proportion. So it's, you know, you hear people in the alternative media always talking about this book and quoting it, but I, I doubt that many of them actually read the book, because I've tried. <laughs> and I, <don't. laughs> I mean, I mean, seriously, you, you, you read the first five pages, and then you've got to spend five months just to research the first five pages, because there's it's so much information. Mm -hmm. and, and unless you're steeped in the history of, of religion and cults and symbology, uh, most of it's for just... Most, for most Freemasonry. For well, most Freemasonry. <clears throat> Not just I mean, Mitchell, I mean Bill Cooper cited Manly P. Hall also on numerous occasions. Sure he did. Yeah, he did. And he knew why. Yeah. It's cause he's... But, you know, the funny thing about it all is, you know, it's... <clears throat> the thing is, you get to a point, you're like, well, how much do I need to know about the other side, if you know what I mean? How much do I need to understand about uh, all this occult knowledge? How much of it is it really going to strengthen my relationship with the Lord or edify me in life. And there's a certain point you go, well, you know, I think I got the big picture. I understand the big picture. I don't have to worry about so much about the minutiae and detail, you know what I mean? 
And now if I was a manly P. Hall or someone who was in his ilk of thinking and study, then yeah, sure. But I'm just your average Joe, blue collar Joe. That's so do I need to know all that? No, it's not going to save me. Let's put it that way. It's not going to change anything that you're saying here. At all. We, are, we are not making of the reading here today <clears throat> either point of salvation. Right. But let me, let me add to your statements that I personally think that the better you know your enemy, the better you always have the chance to discover when lies are presented to you. Sure. I understand what so, you're coming from. But so the better you know your enemy, the easier it is to see the truth in there. I understand where you're coming from. So, you know, God bless you. If anybody wants to read that book, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got a copy, too. You could buy it off me. I could use the money. So, <laughs> so, <you're cheap. laughs> yeah, so many, so many books I still would like to read, for example, Morals and Dogma, but that one you can't get anywhere. So, yeah. <clears throat> That's very well hidden. But anyway, from The Secret Teaching of All Ages by Manly P. Hall, the next quote comes, quote, Yet the cross itself is the oldest of phallic emblems, and the lozenge-shaped windows of cathedrals are proof that the Ionic symbols have survived the destructions of the pagan mysteries. The very structure of the church itself is permeated with phallicism, sexual symbolism, Remove from the Christian church all emblems of priapic origin and nothing is left, end quote. Well, now we can spend a few minutes on analyzing this little paragraph Manly P. Hall wrote in this epic book, The Secret Teaching of All Ages. This is exactly what stopped me always to go into any church whether Protestant or Catholic, a Mormon, a Seventh-day Adventist, a Jehovah's Witnesses, whatever church, all the churches deal with symbolism. When you go into, every, uh, into any Protestant church, the first thing you see is a big cross across the altar. Right? Yeah. And I always thought we are not allowed to make any images. <clears throat> and what is the cross else than an image? Oh, yeah. I mean, who has Jesus in his heart and follows Jesus doesn't need the cross to remind him that our Savior died on the cross for him. And we are not supposed to bow down to any idols or any images. We are even not supposed to bow down to any cross. Yeah. It gets worse. And the church, <laughs> it does, it, it, it any really church. Does. And you can go to any church in the world. And of course, like he says, the um, lozenge shaped windows, so these colorful windows that they have in the churches with apparitions of saints and Mary and Jesus and angels and maybe sometimes even demons, whatever. This are all made for idolatry, idol worship. And that's really, he puts it very well, remove from Christian church all emblems of priapic origin and nothing is left. All you have left is just a house. And isn't that where we are supposed to worship? Just in a house with our friends or our family together? Yeah. Well, there's an awful lot of sexual symbolism in the churches, and most people don't even know that, don't even recognize, don't even see that as such. It's only, you know, it's only it's only guys like us who've done some research, or a guy like Manly P. Hall has done it, uh, made a life, a livelihood, who, who made a livelihood out of this, um, in a name that recognized that, you know, all of it, I mean, you, the, the cross... Um, the ovum shape with the Mary in it or a Christ in it. The all these I images are are pagan in origin and sexual in origin and, and are part of a sex cult that comes that dates back thousands of years. And um, it is it is quite tragic, really, the more you think about it, to realize that 
the average church today is just steeped in paganism. And <clears throat> the average person will never ever even recognize it or see it will 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 fight you tooth and nail what you're saying, so what I'm saying. But um history backs us up. And, uh, you know, the phallic symbol permeates all the churches. It doesn't matter which. It could be, uh, you know, Roman Catholic, Baptist. It could be Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Like, it's they're all part of the same institution. And it's one of the tragedies and one of the sad... We come to realize, you know, that if you're really going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you're, you are going to have to leave the church that you belong to. Others will argue with me about this and say that they are wrong, that there are still Bible-believing Christian churches out there. But um, if they are, they're not structured the way you and I have been exposed to. There is no man behind a podium. There is no hierarchical structure. It's not of Christ. There's no uh, pews and the way it's all designed. None of it is of Christ. It's all of Rome. It's all paganism. And it's, it's a brutal reality to, to come to that. You have to make a decision. Really, it comes down to you can follow, be a follower of Christ or a follower of the group. Most people think that they're actually following Christ by following the group. They're deceived in that nature. They don't really realize that it's actually a personal, it's a personal relationship and the group cannot help you do that. It cannot. You can't help me have a personal relationship with Christ your any more than I can help you. We can talk about we can support each other, but in the end it's a, it's your own efforts, it's my own efforts. It's uh, Christ's own relationship with us or how much time do we want to spend with him, you know? And um it's a scary thought for most of us to think about that because what that means is that everything that you and I have been Taught and indoctrinated to have the importance of being part of the group. You're, you, you know, people are, you know, like a person like me is telling you, you got to throw it away and just have a personal relationship with someone that you cannot personally see. And a lot of people are going to find that unbearable, unacceptable, and look slightly neurotic or crazy because. No, uh, but you made a very good point there. They cannot have a personal relationship with someone they can see. That is the reason of the success of the sun worshippers, because we are worshipping the Creator, who is hidden from us from plain sight, but is with us in the spirit. Well, this and comes down to they, I... And they worship everything that is in the creation, whether it is now this new uh, movement of Gaia and saving the Earth. Uh, you know, uh, milieu stuff, how do you call that in English? Um, uh, you know, um, right. for, the, for the environment. Oh, okay, Gaia, the Gaia movement. Yeah, Gaia and all the, the, the whole environment movement and, uh, you know, the Kyoto Accords with the so-called uh, uh, change of uh, change of the weather and change of the climate, the climate change hoax and sun worship, of course, because the sun you see every morning when it goes up and all day long until in the evening it sets down. So these people need something they see they can believe in. I can see the sun. It's like George Carlin said. I mean, you know George Carlin, right? Sure, of course. He was one of the biggest sun worshippers ever. And he even made a show about that. I am going to pray to the sun because the sun I see in the morning, I see it all day, and I see it in the evening when it goes down. I mean, I, I, I saw this when he, when he did the performance on that, and uh, I thought, yeah, okay, you really uh, came out of the closet here right now. <laughs> what, do you, what, what, what do you think of God and all that stuff? I mean, uh, well, and, yeah. and, that's, and that's the problem. So make these pe let these people have something they can, they can, they can touch, they can see, they can rely on, and they will believe that this is something sacred, and something holy, and something that gives them spirituality. Because they have the problem that the God that you cannot see, that you cannot touch, and you cannot smell, is there. And this is only offered to the ones who worship God in spirit. Because that's where he wants to be worshipped. Right. So that's where they, you know, just like uh, 
what this article is saying, and you're, you and I are reinforcing that's the issue here. Uh, worshiping God it is literally that worshiping spirit. God is spirit. He's, uh, there's all these images are nothing more than false images, all of them. None of them represent truth to anything. You know, we see a picture of uh, Jesus Christ. Well, that's not the true image of Jesus. And when you say all these symbology, the, the, the cross, uh, whatever it may be, all these are man-made constructs, and they're for uh, people who really don't really have a uh, spiritually a faith in. They don't even understand what spirituality is. They think it's as you know being this good, wholesome, nice person and doing good things. Well, that's not spirituality, or um, channeling somehow, channeling the universe and getting the things you want out of life, like the journey versus some kind of a genie in a bottle. You know, a, a spiritual relationship with the God, has, you know what, it's not a public dis- display. He tells us to go in our closets and pray to him. It's to have a private conversation in our heads with him. It's thinking of him. It is walking with God. It is being conscious of God that there is a creator that is something greater than us, created us that we'll never be a God. And, uh, you know, if you walk in that, that, that way, the way, the truth, and the light, you have no use for the priest, you have no use for the church, you have no use for any of them. And that's the big issue. The issue is, is that religion, once again, as we know, has been used as a tool to oppress us, to, to enslave us, not only spiritually but physically, and that if you are constantly bombarded with false images, you become a casualty, as we all have been. And what does that mean now to actually come out, come out of her, my people? Well, that means rejecting all this, all this that you've been brainwashed and indoctrinated and that has nothing at all to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, nothing. So when you see that, that, that you know, it might be beautiful the pink glass window and it might be beautiful the, the, all the different images and paintings and all that but you just remind yourself that what you're looking at is the imaginations of man and not of the truth not of God and it's the reality So it's, it's a hard one to look for most of us to let go and uh, most will never let go there we go I'm done you there? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still there. You know, Jesus put it in a very great way. He said, wherever two or three of you are gathered together, in their midst I will be. Yeah. And it all comes down to that, you know. You don't need to follow all the sheep running into a church. And um, I saw a video once from uh, Jordan Maxwell. <laughs> sure. <Who> explains. <laughs> Daniel Manuel P. Hall, Jordan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we we all know we all know who John Maxwell is all about. Okay, yeah. Manuel P. Hall's crony, Manuel <laughs> P. Hall's crony or a follower, you know, little disciple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. He was uh, yeah, Manuel P. Hall was his mentor, something like that. Oh yeah. So, um, the point is, uh, he made uh, a lecture on I think secrets of the Bible, something like that. It's called. I saw it years ago, two, three years ago, really far off. And he made a very interesting point. He said, you know, the word church comes from, um, I think it was the Irish or whatever, or the Scottish, the word Kirk. And that derives from the Greek Caesarea. Now, Caesarea was a goddess who lived in a temple and rang the bells. And when all the men came into her temple to worship her, she transformed them into pigs and fed of them. (laughs) <laughs> and when you get that picture, this is exactly what the Roman Catholic Church does with their churches. On Sunday at 10 o'clock, they run the bell, everybody storms into the port, storms into, inside of the church, and gets indoctrinated with their lives. So the church feeds on the Maybe you can call it dumbness. I don't can think of another word right now. Can maybe put another word in there because you know, not Native American speakers, so sometimes I have to miss my words. But 
they, they feed of the ignorance of the people going into the church and indoctrinate them. And like in the, in, in the Greek mythology, when, when she is feeding of them, it means eating them. That's exactly what the church today does. It's well, eating it, it, them it, spiritually. It's the blind leading the blind is what it is. I don't believe that the majority of the pastors or the priests out there uh, are deliberately mean to deceive and corrupt people. It's the corrupt or the blind leading the blind. They're already corrupt. So it's, it's, it's you know, what, what do you do about that situation? Um, yeah, the point is that maybe the pastors don't want to deceive the people they are teaching, but the point is that they have been indoctrinated themselves with spiritual formation and spiritual exercises through their seminaries that gave them the, uh, the possibility to preach from on the pulpit. Uh, and of course, they think they are doing good, but actually they are leading everyone into um, oblivion, into, in, in, into, in, into uh, perishment. Yeah, 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 enslavement. Into, into damnation. Yeah. They're enslaving them and enslaving them into a, a man's way of religion. It's and, they religion. Often, and they often even have the good intention. Absolutely, most of them do. Spoke, we spoke about that sometime, uh, sometime earlier ago. Um, that many people who believe in God will, in the end, turn onto us, real Christians, and kill us because they think they will do God's work. And it is written in the Bible that that will happen. Well, it's happening right now. So It's, not it's really happening that. already right now. Right. It's been happening for almost well, two, almost 2,000 years. So it's not like it's something new. You and I are in a, in a comfortable, fortunate position not to be one of them right now, but this certainly could change tomorrow for us. And uh, we've got to remember that it's happening right now, and um, it always will happen. You know? well, one, one thing is for sure, the devil is wiser than I am, so he can always trick me, and I have to be very alert every moment of my life not to be tricked by the devil. Yeah, when, and then all the answer to that is, is uh, look what we did Saturday, you know, we had that Bible study with a couple of us, you know, it's to study the Bible together, it's to study the Word of God, not man's Word, not man's creations, but the Word of God. Yeah, when you mention that right here, and we tell the people that we needed six hours for the first five chapters of Matthew, they were going to laugh at us. <laughs> sure, they really, it, took, it took that long, and we could have even extended the, the six hours that we did on that or seven hours. Well, that's what we're supposed to do. That's you know, most people have been trained just to read the Bible, but it actually we're supposed to, we're commanded to study the Word of God. And what does that actually mean to study? That means to have to meditate, contemplate, to, to think it through, to compare it with what we know, what we don't know, what others have said. You know, it's to really think it out. And um, you know, a lot of folks will say, "Well, you know, this this whole learning stuff—it's a little bit too gnostic, not too much of gnosticism going on." Well, no, it's not. I mean. Uh, Gnosticism is completely different than actually studying the Word of God. Gnosticism is all about your own ter personal interpretation, which never is your own. It's somebody else's. It's the groups. And it's all about denying the, di the divinity of Jesus Christ and that somehow you will be a little God, that you could be your own Christ. And you know what? No, we cannot be. It's one of those brutal realizations. You realize that uh, you will never save yourself. Um, and this, in the in the worldly sense, you could get, present a an appearance of being saved. You can certainly excel in the world and in its structure and become a dominant figure of your day, but you will not save yourself. You only damn yourself by acting and pretending to be some kind of little god man. So we go back to like what's with uh, the Pope. And this is a fine example of what we're talking about here, what it leads to with all this idolatry and all this symbolism. And you look at these poor folks in the Philippines, and we're talking the largest Catholic stronghold in Asia, where millions and millions and millions of, of people treat the Pope, a man who walks around in slippers and a dress and pretends to be God, uh, a mere mortal, a, 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 Mithra, a, a priest of Mithraism, 
who cannot even tell his people the truth. These people are, are bowing down to him and praising him, singing, of all things, praising, saying, long live the Pope. Now, in the pagan Rome, they used to be long live the Caesar. Now it's long live the Pope. And um, it's, very, it's very disturbing the more and more you look into what's going on with what religion does. It, it's, it's a tool that man has used to enslave, enslave other men. And it's tragic. It's terrible. And under the guise of Christianity, because if you actually study like we have done, those five or six chapters in Matthew, you and I will, will attest that we've learned more reading, studying those five, six chapters than we ever would have just reading the Bible on our own and just reading it and just assuming that we actually had any understanding about it. And... Um, the only way we could have had that five or six hour study of five or six verse, uh, chapters is by coming out of the church and finding like-minded folks where there are very few right now who are truly interested in knowing the Word of God. What they want to do is they just want to get together and play church, whether in their homes or in a, a, uh, a cathedral uh, or a basilica, whatever. Uh, what it's all about is a display uh, for men, for each other. It's not a display to God. It's a display for each other. And um, it's really, it's tiring and it's tragic, and most people won't ever even hear what I'm saying because who am I? Who are you, Mike Adams? You're nobody. And you know what? You're right. I'm nobody. I know nothing. But the one thing I do know at this point is that going to a church it's not going to save me. It's not going to develop a personal relationship with God. And it's just going to be more wasted time. Well, I, I just have to interrupt you here a little bit. Um, you say, who am I, uh, Michael Adams? I'm, I'm nobody. And I mean, the same counts for me. But the point is, it is written in the Bible, go ye out there and teach the gospel to all the creatures. Right? Yeah. I am not that learned in reading the Bible that I can teach the Bible to all the people. But what I try to do and what you try to do with this wonderful broadcast that we are having here since a few months already, and we have quite a fellowship, not only today, but also online. And even now that I put most of the shows that I do here, or later on the other shows that you did here also, which are worth it, putting them on a video on YouTube that people can get this. This is my way of fulfilling God's will, to go out there and teach the gospel. This is my way to teach the gospel, to try to wake people up to the deception they have been living in. And that is your way to do it. You cannot maybe do it in the way that Jesus intended it, by reading the Bible, reading the gospel to the people, and I cannot do that. People like Tom could do that. Probably even people like Walt Stickle could do that, but I cannot do it. I, I know that. The Holy Ghost has not anointed me to do that work at least for now. But this gift that I have been given to search for the truth and share that with the people in our broadcast here, that is what I am supposed to do. And I think in that I am doing God's work, God's work as good as I can. And you do too. So don't say you are nothing. You are more than a lot of other people who just sit in their chair, eat their cheeseburger, drink their diet coke, and smoke a joint and don't do anything. <laughs> well, so you, have picked, you have picked it up some months ago and you said that was shortly after I met you and you said I'm going to start a broadcast on talk show radio because I want to get the truth out and you called it nothing but the truth and that Michael was a very important step in your life you were sure and I love you for that you're doing that and that you give me and other people the opportunity to come on your broadcast and to share the truth with other people. And whoever is not listening to us is wrong, but they have to know that for themselves. But we try the best to our ability to spread the gospel, to spread the truth among all the people, all the listeners. Sure. So don't say you're nothing. Well, actually, I don't mind being nothing, so... <laughs> So when I, you know, but you get my point, right? It's not to put you on a pedal stool or something. It's just saying you at least do something. Yeah. Well, I, you know, it's only because God is is 
prompted me and motivated me to do this because uh, all glory goes to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and my Heavenly Father because <clears throat> if it was me, I wouldn't be doing this. There's a lot more uh, more comfortable. You know, let's find the Holy Spirit <clears throat> to do these broadcasts and to bring people to the truth and try to shake people up out of their sleep that they have in this matrix system that we discussed on so many other broadcasts to let them see that there is more to life than just in the morning, wake up, do your work, in the evening, come home, watch television, make love to your wife, and the, mor- and the next morning start it all over again. <laughs> Well, yeah, for most of us, that's, that's what life turns out to be, doesn't it? <clears throat> With the burdensome thing of going to church on Sunday and going and looking at all these pagans and being given a, a, a half-hearted sermon <clears throat> about really about not much of anything, really. So, <clears throat> you know, when I started thinking about already some time ago, when I when I walk my dog, even on Sundays around noontime. I thought sometimes, because then I passed the church here in Bielik, that little community that I live in here in Belgium, and I passed that church and I see people come out of the church, and I thought I would need some kind of a pamphlet that I made and stand outside of the church and give that into every hand that comes out of the church to let them see how they are just being betrayed by coming out of the church of their beliefs and lead these people to God. I haven't done that yet because I haven't made a pamphlet like 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 that because I I, I can do that in that convincing uh, even then in Dutch of course I have to do that <laughs> in that convincing manner that they maybe would be attracted to it but I see me do that in the future I tell you I see me doing that in the future stand outside of the church and give the people something to think about when they come out of it and of course I will probably be attacked for that or maybe even arrested but I don't care. Well, if God motivates you, prompts you to do that, then... Well, the motivation I have, you can be sure of that. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm on fire. You know, that is funny. Every time that we do this broadcast, like, I'm on fire for that. Yeah. I really love to take people to the truth and wake them up from their slumber. It's funny that you, you talk about that. You know, when I first surrendered to the Lord, you know, you go through this whole... They talk about, you know, you're being on fire, like you said, and... Uh, and uh, for the word and for Christ, and you know, I'm gonna get out there and I'm gonna teach the word on the street and pass out pamphlets and knock on people's doors. And uh, you know, the Lord actually like sat me down and you know, really <laughs> hit me hard with this. Mike, if this time around, why don't you actually just study my word? Why don't you just get to know me and leave it at that, you know, the opportunities will come for you to share the truth when I give it to you. Instead of you forcing it like everyone else has done and making a, this, you know, acting like a religious zealot, why don't you just be a follower of me? What did Christ, what did Christ actually ask us to do? He asked us to study his word, to live in his word, to know his word. It comes back to the same point that I was making when I was speaking about how they are <clears throat> why they are doing the sun worship and idol worship, things they can, things they can see and they can touch. Uh, people rather believe a man that stands in front of them and tells them something because it's a man they can see and they can rely to instead of picking up a book that has been written 2,000 years ago and take anything out of that. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's... It's you know it, it, it's a lot. There's a lot of reasons for it. I mean, if you look at the, how much effort that the I well, you and I have gone through the, the amount of the changes that we had to go through to even get to this point of having this conversation today. I mean, it's an immense amount of changes. It wasn't something that happened overnight, and it wasn't going through a, oh, no. going to a church that these changes came about. It was you know it was you working one-on-one with God, learning all these different things, learning the truth of your reality around you, coming to a realization that there is no other answer but Jesus Christ, just like me. <clears throat> and then you, you go from there, you know, and it's, it's, it becomes a personal journey with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It has nothing to do with religion, period. Now, people will argue with me and say, well, to believe in Jesus Christ and to read the Bible is a religion in itself. Well, yeah, you know, it's Christ, it's Jesus Christ's religion. It's my God's religion. It's not man's religion. 
That's God's religion, and his religion has nothing to do. It's not about brick and mortar. It's not about getting together and, ha- and just socializing. It's not about, you know, it's, it's much deeper than the and It isn't even about the group. It's about me and my walk with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is my answer for all of my dilemmas, my problems, my sinful nature, the fact, you know, for eternal salvation, Jesus Christ is my answer. Now, where, where I were bringing up this, you know, the, these identity or the, the characteristics of the Antichrist, this is that people will understand fully, somebody will understand that nothing, no religious institution, nothing of man will save you. It will only do one thing, as it has always done. We study about this Babylonian system that now we call Roman Catholicism. Its, it's, its design has always been to enslave you. End of story. Why do you come oh, out of it? Power. It's all yeah. about power. It started from Satan on down, you know, and it's just, and it's it's about taking it away uh, any of your tr- any real hope. Any real hope in Christ? And people will argue and argue with me and say, "No, and I believe in Jesus Christ. I'm a Roman Catholic." And you know what? I'm not saying they don't. But the more and more you grow and walk with the Lord, I've seen this over and over again in my life and others. Is that people come out of these churches because they realize that it's not what God wants them to be in. He wants them to have a personal relationship. That building, those symbols, those phallic symbols, those sex symbols, those. Whatever, you know, none of those, all of those are there is to, it's just like television if, or a video on, online. I mean, all these videos that they make with the, the music behind it and the imagery and all that. And do you really actually get, have, get any closer to God by that? You know, the truth is you don't. It's designed that way for you. Not, it's designed to suck you in and follow somebody else's train of thought. And, you know, when you're going to walk with God, you do have to have that quiet time, that quiet time with him, him alone. It's not, just, you know, there's a point when it's, you know, it's no longer just about learning, but it's about uh, a personal relationship with him and actually learning how to hear the, hear the Holy Ghost, hear the Holy Spirit of God when he's talking to you, even to develop that skill of, that, of really recognizing when God is talking to you and he's not. And if you have the computer on all the time, and if you have your music on all the time, and if you're going to church with all the imagery all the time and all the music that's going on, none of that is designed specifically for you to have a personal relationship with God. No, it's not. Not even close to it. You know, this, the music thing, the imagery... The way the sermon's all designed, it's designed to you to idolize the pastor, the, the priest, the church, the building, the institution, the group. And if you start walking with God, you, you come to a realization that you really don't need anything that they're offering. You don't personally need that. They need you to be there. They need you to be part of it. They need you to back up to them. They need you to give them their tithes, your tithes to them. They need you to support them and justify their position. But if you really have a personal relationship with God, you don't need any of that. You don't need any of it. And it's it's it. That's what God. That's what Christ gave us he, to, to truly free us in this world. There is liberty in Christ in Jesus Christ. Sorry for my preaching. Maybe we should get back to your reading. <laughs> yes, all right. He's, he, is, uh, he is freeing us from this world and uh, setting us up in his world, in his kingdom, which is not of this world, as it is written. But another very important point and the motivation to make this broadcast on characteristics of Antichrist is um, that you have to know your adversary. But you also have to know who your friend is. And your friend is Jesus Christ. So first of all, before listening to this characteristics of the Antichrist, you have to see Christ in your life. If you haven't found Christ in your life, you will not understand this reading either. No, you won't. You'll find it as just us being attacking the Roman Catholic Church. and That's that's not really what it's about. It's about... um, like truth is the new hate speech. This is something people would say who haven't found Christ over this broadcast. Mm-hmm. This is just hate speech. 
where <laughs> even we can cite so many documents and quotations, even coming from the Roman Catholic Church itself, yeah. that just conform and confirm everything that we are saying here. Because everything that we are saying here, we just suck it out of our thumb. These are documented facts that we took, of course, from remnantofgod.org, from Nicholas's website. He did all the work before us. God right. bless for that. Thank you very much. But we don't state anything here that is just our opinion. We state the things that are fact, that are written down in books, that are written down in Roman Catholic documents, and that are quotations from people outside of the church or even inside of the church. But okay, I think I'm going to go on reading because we still have a little bit to do to finish this point. And uh, I want to know that we're only 19th characteristic of Antichrist today because, and we still have some things to finish this point so that we'll uh, uh, next characteristic number 20, but this will go to another uh, to another extent of the reading, so sure. I hope it's all right with you. Uh, we will, of course, interrupt ourselves in the reading when we come into something interesting that we will discuss like we did now in the last half hour. Okay. And I thank you very much for your input here, Mike, because this kind of conversation is exactly the reading. Why well, um, Guests in our chat room, and uh, I read the chat, okay, and I understood the question about uh, breaking bad and do the explanation again. I will do that later on, like I wrote uh, there on. But first things first, first we're going to go to number 19, the uh, characteristic number 19 of identifying the Antichrist, okay? So we stopped with the quote from the secret teaching of all ages by Manly P. Hall. And the next quote is also taken from that book, but I don't know, I, I'm not that good in Roman letters. It's CLXXXV. So XXXV is 35, I know that, but CL, I don't know, what C is 100? No, 100 is D. Yeah. What does C stand for? 500? Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I'm not going to answer. I don't know. I, I, thought, I, thought, I thought C stands I for can, 500, can... L stands for 50, so that would be... Page I know, I know X, 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 V, uh, v is, is 10, and V is 5. That's 35. L yeah. would be either. 500, I think. Is it? Okay. I think it's 500, or, or D, I don't know. Anyway, it's from that page, from the Secret of the Global Ages, from Manly P. Hall, another quote that reads, quote, When the zealots of the primitive Christian church sought to Christianize paganism, the pagan initiates retorted with a powerful effort to paganize Christianity. The Christians failed, but the pagans succeeded. With the decline of paganism, the initiated pagan hierophants transferred their base of operations to the new vehicle of primitive Christianity, adopting the symbols of the new cult to conceal those eternal verities which are ever the priceless possessions of the wise. End quote. The Christians failed because Christ would have no agreement with such error. He would never sanction mixing truth with error. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 29 to 32 confirms that perfectly. And now follows a little quote from a lady that I do not really trust 100%, but wrote a great book, The Great Controversy, Ellen G. White from the SDA Church. <clears throat> and from that page 50 of her book, the quote reads as follows. The world, cloaked with a form of righteousness, walked into the church. Now the work of corruption rapidly progressed. Paganism, while appearing to be vanquished, became the conqueror. Her spirit controlled the church. Her doctrines, ceremonies, and superstitions were incorporated into the faith and worship of the professed followers of Christ. End quote. Now you can think of Ellen G. White, whatever you want. I don't see her as a prophet. 
and the SDA church has been founded by Freemasons, and there's a very good video on that on YouTube that you can find. And uh, if you ask for it later on, I can give you the link if you want to see it. But still, some of her work contained a lot of truth. But, and this is the thing that I want to make my point on, um, she was not a prophet, and it was not the Holy Spirit who spoke through her. Next quote comes from Will Durant, The Age of Faith, 1950 edition, pages 745 and 746. Quote, The belief in miracle-working objects, talismans, amulets, and formulas was dear to Christianity, and they were received from pagan antiquity. The vestments of the clergy and the papal title of Pontifex Maximus were legacies from pagan Rome. The Roman Catholic Church found that rural converts still revert certain springs, wells, trees, and stones. She, she thought it wiser to bless these to Christian use than to, break, than to break too sharply the customs of sentiment. Pagan festivals, dear to the people, reappeared as Christian feasts, and pagan rites were transformed into Christian liturgy. The Christian calendar of saints replaced the Roman fasti, or gods. Ancient divinities dear to the people were allowed to revive under the names of Christian saints. Gradually, the tenderest features of Astarte, Fideli, Artemis, Diana, and Isis were gathered together in the worship of Mary. End quote. Now, this is a little paragraph in the whole PDF document we are reading, but I think this needs a little bit further explanation to go into. Don't you think, Michael? As far as the, the worship of Mary? Yeah. Uh, well, in the end, it goes over the worship of Mary, but the most important part I read, pagan festivals dear to the people reappeared as Christian feasts, and the pagan rites were transformed into Christian liturgy. <laughs> Today we have the 19th of January, so it is just three and a half weeks that we passed, or almost four weeks that we passed the pagan ritual of Christmas, mm -hmm. the so-called birthday of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which of course, when you study the Bible, you know, was not the 25th of December, even though Christ's birthday is not revealed. What do you think is the reason why God did not reveal the birthday of Jesus Christ to us explicitly in the Bible, Michael? Because he didn't feel it was important enough to. <laughs> because the important part was the end of Christ's life. He wanted, he wanted us to serve Jesus Christ and to follow him and not to celebrate his birthday, but to celebrate him every day of our life. Well, yeah, in, 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 you know, there's the... The, mor the mortal man, if you will, the, the flesh part that, very, once again, is the eyes. Men were using their eyes again instead of recognizing the spiritual aspect of Christ. And his great accomplishment was by and through the Heavenly Father that he... If we knew he the died of Christ and if we celebrated it every year, it would just take us away from the spirituality of Christ. Well, yeah, and then he would... Uh, Man oriented is about the flesh once again, isn't it? Right. Exactly. Plus, then you look at the the, the pagan trinity and the uh, father, mother, son thing, and the, you know we're talking about getting into Mary worship, what it's all really about. So, yeah, it's uh, wasn't it? So this, yeah, so this pagan festival of Christmas uh, is a little bit behind us, and the next pagan festival of Easter is just coming to us. And, um, Ishtar, yeah, and uh, the goddess of fertility. That's why you have the axe on, uh, on Easter, you know? It's a fertility sign. Or like we said before, um, the Roman Catholic Church and their festivals, some worship are filled with sexual symbols. Oh, yeah. Like, for example, the axe. Like, for example, when you go to... Uh, St. Peter's Dome in the Vatican, uh, you will see big, um, what's, what's the name? Um, 
pineapple, uh, no, not pineapples, um, pine cones. From, from you know from 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 trees, pine cones is the name, right? Sure, right. Uh, pine cones outside of that, and that's also fertility sign. It's it, it's right in your face, and they succeeded in baptizing all these pagan festivals for Christians, so that Christians under the guise would participate in their pagan festivals not knowing what they actually are worshipping or what they are actually um, uh, having, having a party around, like, like with Christmas, like with, um, like with Easter. All right. So this is one of the very important things because when you look into our Roman calendar that we have today, there is not one holy day of the Bible that is the so-called holiday in that calendar, not one. And I also spoke on that a little bit earlier on another broadcast, I remember, because this is something that always um, let me question my belief in God that I had as a child, that I didn't have been, uh, as a child, because I always question things like this. Easter is every year on another date. But when on Good Friday you so-called celebrate the death of Christ on the cross on Golgotha, where he was crucified, and he died that day, that is a date. Like, I was born the 17th of June, and my father died the 21st of November. Every year again, when the 21st of November comes, I know that is the day my father died. That never changes from year to year. But the day of Christ's death in the Roman Catholic Church changes every year. So how could that be the death of Christ? And that's how I, as a not believer in that time, identified this Roman Catholic festival as being false doctrine. And instead of going to search the truth behind that, I pushed it all away and did, didn't, want any have to, uh, didn't want to have anything to do with it. That was my error, 45 years long. And then I finally came to the truth, and now I know why it is that way, and why it is this here, and why it always changes, because I knew the moon, the first full moon after, I don't know, March or whatever. I, I don't go into detail here right now, but you can all look that up. And um, that never made sense to me. How can the, the, the day that Jesus Christ died change every year? Not logical. Well, I'm not going to argue with you about it, that's for sure. You're right. <laughs> You're right. A lot of stuff. I don't know, you can always argue with me when I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's just a, just another example how religion is used to control the masses, to manipulate the masses, um, and, to, you know, to, to get us to not question things. You know, like, a lot of people, you know, they, they, I'm sure they've had the same questions you've had, but they just go, oh, well, that's the way it is. Instead of asking, you know, why is this the way it is? Why won't things change? Why do we still have to do these ridiculous things? Well, and then, you know, those of those will say, well, I like Easter. I like the holidays. I like Christmas. And I understand why they do, because it's an opportunity to have fun and joy and to be with their family and all that kind of stuff. The other question I ask is, why isn't that not happening any other days of the, of the year? we got 365 days from, based on the Roman calendar to do it to celebrate family and and life and joy, why did we have to do it under these pagan holidays? You know, why is this so, even at the year 2015, is um, these pagan holidays still being foisted on us and pushed on us? Why, if we're so advanced and so developed and so further, you know, that somehow we climbed out of the dark ages, do we still have these these holidays? To, um, and why, you know, uh, 
These because they're pagan Catholic holidays. You know why can't we celebrate other people's holidays? Why in our in, in those of us who live uh, in the Roman Empire, why do we only have to get these holidays? And these are questions that should be seriously asked. You know, and of course, the decision then is, you know, are you going to do anything about it, or are you going to just comply like you do with everything else in life? Over here in Europe, they are already introducing now Muslimic holidays into our calendar. They are trying to do that in Germany right now. I know of one or two days in the year that they want to make it a feast day or a holiday because of uh, the Muslims. And here in Belgium, where I live, uh, some kilometers from here, um, is, the, uh, is the French border. So not, not the border to France, but the border to the... Uh, it's not a border, but it's where the French-speaking part of Belgium is because I live in the Dutch-speaking part. And uh, some 10 kilometers from here to the south, the French-speaking part starts. And in that French-speaking part, they started already last year by abolishing the Christmas holiday, which is now just for the children to go to church, the winter holiday. And Easter holiday is now the spring holiday. And they changed it because they don't want to insult the Muslim community living over there in the French-speaking part of Belgium. What you've probably heard about because there was uh, these attacks in Verviers, which is a city near to the, uh, close to the German border, uh -huh. some, uh, some 80 kilometers, 90 kilometers from my home here, where that false flag happened over there. But they have here the same Muslim agenda they have everywhere. So they are even trying to change the so-called Christian holidays and add holidays from other religions like from the Muslims. <laughs> Just for in case that you didn't know I said to you today. You know, I, I personally am not someone who's advocating to get rid of any of it. I'm just saying that if you are a follower of Christ, you have to ask yourself the question, should you be following these holy days, these holy days? Should you be part of it at all? Absolutely. And, and, and it's not surprising, and it's a fine example of what happened uh, in the early days of Christianity when they paganized it and the reason why they did. And now we're seeing what the next step and or the next, quote, unquote, evolution in uh, this uh, religion, a world, one world religion, of you know, assimilating uh, Islam, which ironically was created by Rome in the first place. So what's the you know? It, they look, they mirror so much to each other. Is it really that far of a stretch that they would actually end up sharing the same holy days? I mean, no, not really, not at all. So. Um, not surprising, and it's all part of their Hegelian dialect strategy of, you know, the two opposing forces and this synthesis of what they want. They want to create this new world or a uh, new world religion that would be a blending of, you know, the major religions, which the two major ones are Roman Catholicism and Islam. Those are two big ones. And, of course, they want to somehow unite them together. One way or the other, they're going to do it. Uh, yeah, Roman Catholicism and uh, Islam together have more than, I think, two and a half billion followers all over the world. Oh, well, they got more than that. <laughs> yeah, I said more than two and a half. Yeah. I don't know. Right? But, you know, and you look, it's, they call it Chrislam, you know, the Christ. <laughs> yeah, the Christ I told you about that, right? The, the, yeah, the blend, yeah, the blending of uh, Christianity with uh, Islam, but that's that's a lie. It's not a blending of Christianity and Islam. It's a blending of pagan Catholicism and pagan Islam together. There's no blending Christianity, true Christianity, there's no blending in any of it. That's why you also have uh, always to be very careful when you read the news about Christian persecution in other countries. Then you first have to see, are there Christians persecuted or Roman Catholics? Right. So there's a valid point in that. So, you know, and the thing is, if you are a Christian, there is no blending. You're supposed to be coming out. They know this. The ruler, you know, those are, who are making this all happen. The elite, if you will, starting with the Rome and the Jesuits and everyone else involved in the UN and whatever. 
the Luciferians, they all know what the deal is. They know it better than we do. They know that if you're a real follower of Christ, you are not joining the group. You aren't joining the group. You joined Jesus. <laughs> you know, you are now, quote, unquote, like Tom says, you're a rebel. Whether you want to be or not, you know, you're a rebel. And uh, uh, there's no joining. There's no being part of. Fundamental Bible-believing Christians are marked the new terrorists. Already sure. in the United States of America. Because if, you, if enough of papers, us... Are, yeah, when you read through the papers of the, 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 the Patriot Act and uh, Homeland Security doctrines. Because yeah. we're the ones that can do... We're the only ones that can slow the progress potentially even derail the pro you know, the their goals. You know. But yeah, we'll see what happens. God, we'll see. you know, it's all in God's hands, so all we can do is expose and sit back and watch and put our trust in Christ. So Expose is a good word. I'm gonna expose a little bit more. I'm reading from the Semitic Lithology of Ace Edge Langdon, nineteen thirty one edition. The next quote <clears throat> Langdon tells us that Mary worship came from the ancient Babylon, where the virgin mother goddess was worshipped under the name of Ishtar. Elsewhere in the Near East, the mother goddess was called Astarte, Ashtoreth, Persephone, Artemis or Diana of Ephesus, Venus, and Isis. This goddess, considered to be greater than any god, was called by these heathen the Virgin Mother, Merciful Mother, Queen of Heaven, and My Lady. My Lady, you have to know, stands for Madonna in Italian. Ma is mine, and Donna is Lady. Madonna, My Lady. Langdon says she was often sculptured in mother and infant images, or as Mother Dolorum, or Sorrowful Mother, interceding for men with a wrathful God, and thus ancient paganism was brought into the churches and lives of Christians. End quote. Yeah. <laughs> Mother Mary. Or Columbia, that you can also call her. And when you ever visit the Big Apple, that big Statue of Liberty standing out there in the harbor, what is that? <laughs> uh, the Queen of Heaven, the... Uh, the Mother Mary. A symbol of uh, Mithraism, and um, yeah, it's it's yeah. And a very important thing that is said here. Um, uh, interceding, so um, and this mother infant images, or as a uh, as a mother dolorum, a sorrowful mother, interceding for men with a wrathful God. Um, it is written here in our chat room some time ago. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and no Mother Mary. So thanks for putting the quote out there that is coming in handy right now. I think that was Walt who wrote that. <laughs> um, anyway, um, check um, the top of the Capitol in Washington, D.C., who is sitting on there? Mother Mary. Um, go to Hollywood. Columbia Pictures. You have the name Columbia already. What is that? Mother Mary. Holding up the torch of light, of enlightenment. I mean, it's so in your face. You won't even have to think about that anymore when you see that you... When you study that a little bit like we do, you see that... What do you mean? What do you mean there, Jorg? That the, I thought the Freemasons won the Hollywood. Yeah, no, but the Freemasons are just another arm of the, are just <laughs> the Protestant arm of the Jesuits, Michael. I'm just being cynical. <laughs> I know, I know. Because you know, Me too. <laughs> cause the more and more you study this, the more you realize that the, the Freemasons are nothing more than tools for the papacy and uh, for Rome, and they're just nothing more but doing Rome's bidding. Since, yeah, that, that's yeah. the reason why the Roman Catholic Church forbids, forbids their members to join Freemasonry, because Freemasonry is the Protestant arm of the Jesuits. 
Now that, that they are already in the Catholic arm, they don't need the Protestant arm to join that too. You know? That ban has actually been lifted, from what I understand, and that was lifted back uh, what in the 60s, 70s, with uh, Pope uh, Paul or John or whatever John Paul, whatever he is, <laughs> the one Pope who actually was a, a, a Freemason and uh, Paul the Sixth. So, uh, from my understanding, that has now been just. Dis- that that band has been disbanded. I, apparently, they they accomplished what they needed through Freemasonry, which to totally and absolutely control, corrupt the and control the Protestant churches and their daughter churches and infiltrate governments. And they uh, no longer, I guess, have the need to uh, band it. Yeah, I think today it doesn't matter for them anymore. The Catholics are also in the Protestant arm of uh, Freemasonry or the Protestant arm of the Jesuits as long as they are under their wings. Right. Yeah. It's amazing how, how the more and more you study how much Rome will, Rome dominates their lives. Therefore, we must be members and part of the Roman Empire. There is no way of getting out of it. At this point, yeah. and you're getting a lot of work. We're, we're subjects. We're subject of the Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, which now you know. You know when you look at the Pope, and he, you know the Pope is nothing more than the Caesar. We just call him the Pope now. <laughs> That's all he is. You know? No, I still call him Pontifex Maximus. So yeah, this is the same title that the Caesars bore. Yeah, and also the pharaohs of old in Egypt. Anyway, uh, I go on reading. Sure. From Gordon J. Lane, Survivals of Roman Religion, also from the 1931 edition. Some pages, I don't name them up here, it's not important. Lane mentions <clears throat> several other corruptions by which the mother goddess was worshipped by heathens that Rome adopted into Christianity. Holy water, votive offerings, elevation of sacred objects, or lifting of the host, the priest's bells, the decking of images, processions, festivals, prayers for the dead, the worship of relics, and the statues of the saints. End quote. Two dominant elements brought to Christianity from paganism by Rome were sun worship symbols and religious practices of ancient Babylon. The solar theology of the Chaldeans, or Babylonians, had decisive effect upon the final form reached by the religion of the pagan Semites and following them by that of the Romans, when the Roman Emperor Aurelian, the conqueror of Palmyra, or Palm, Palmyra had raised Sol Invictus, or the invincible sun god, to the rank of supreme divinity in the empire. This quote comes from the Cambridge Ancient, His- Ancient History, Volume 11. From Palmyra, he transferred to the new sanctuary the images of Helios, the sun god, and Bel, the Malay's patron god of Babylon. This comes from Common, the original religions in Roman paganism, 1911 edition. The point where he always puts the editions by there is very important because you have to know that a lot of publisher companies have been taken over by the Rockefeller Foundation, starting... <coughs> uh, around the beginning of the First World War. So like many encyclopedias and many many books even from those times, uh, you have to get the original edition or older editions from before 1911 to really get the original writing and not the, by Jesuit, corrupted writing afterwards. Also, even, uh, even though I have my resentments about the book The Great Controversy, it's the same thing. Uh, you have the original uh, publishing of 1888, and then you have later uh, publishings from 1894 and uh, 1908 or something, uh, and these are also corrupted. So when you are checking books on historicism and on teachings like this what we are doing right here, see to get the original edition. This is also where he always puts the edition by there from that book is taken. The removal of the capital of the empire from Rome to Constantinople in 330 AD left the Western Church practically free from imperial power to develop its own form of organization. Ah, 
that is to me the formation of the little horn. The Bishop of Rome, in the seat of the Caesars, was now the greatest man in the West. Okay, I get, again, next sentence, confirmation, what I said. And was soon, when the barbarians overran the empire, forced to become the political as well as the spirit, spiritual head. This quote comes from A.C. Flick, The Rise of the Medieval Church, page 168. Next quote. Whatever Roman elements the barbarians and Arians left came under the protection of the Bishop of Rome, who was the chief person there after the emperor's disappearance. The Roman Church in this way privily pushed itself into the place of the Roman world empire, of which it is the actual continuation. The empire has not perished, but has only undergone a transformation. The Catholic Church is a political creation and as imposing as a world empire because it is a continuation of the Roman Empire. The Pope, who calls himself King and Pontifex Maximus, there you see Michael, all comes back, the title of the Roman Emperor in the time of Christ is Caesar's successor. This quote was taken from Adolf Harnack, What is Christianity, 1963. And we go along with another quote that reads from the American Catholic Quarterly Review, April of 1911. Quote, Long ages ago, when Rome, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to rule them, and thus commands the temporal sovereignty of the popes. And meekly steeping, stepping to the throne of Caesar, the vicar of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages. End quote. This is just Andrea Lagarde, The Latin Church of the Middle Ages, from 1915, page 6, reads, Speaking of the time about 500 AD, when the Roman Empire was crumbling to pieces, No, the Catholic Church will not descend into the tomb. It will survive this empire. At length, a second empire will arise, and of this empire, the Pope will be the master. More than this, he will be the master of Europe. He will dictate his orders to kings who will obey them. End quote. And reading from Roman society from near to Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, page 7, we already had a quote from the same book earlier on, quote, from the foregoing, which treats merely of the more important solar festivals, it is clear that these products of paganism are as much in force at present, at present as they ever were, and that Christianity countenances, and in many cases has actually adopted the practiced pagan rites whose heathen significance is merely lost, <clears throat> is merely lost sight of because attention is not called to the source whence those rites have spring. So heavy was this infiltration that Sir Samuel Dill exclaims, Christianity is only a sect of the Mithraists, end quote. Now notice this below. Notice how Babylon invented the doctrine to worship the pagan sun god. Then notice the Christian church of Rome adopting 100% of the pagan doctrines giving them Christian names. What you will find here is a both shocking and heartbreaking, to say the least. So many devout people have been talked into worshipping the creature over and above the Creator Himself. So now follows, follows a little tablet where we uh, compare the doctrines of the pagan sun gods and the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Um, you see that tablet before you, right? Shall I read that whole tablet or shall we jump over this? Because this is really, really long. <laughs> it has some... Um, 
40, 50 points. I think uh, we should read them. Because yeah. I think, you, know, you know, we're talking at... Uh, you, know what we, you know what we do? We, we, we it, don't it, split that up. We don't split that up, and that may be easier for our listeners to follow. I will read the column of the doctrines of the pagan sun gods, and you will then read the equivalent doctrines of the Catholic Church. So yeah. when I read, it will be the pagan sun god, and when you read, it will be the doctrines of the Catholic Church. In right. that way, everybody in the broadcast can follow that a little bit, because when I just read it or you just read it, it is a little bit too hard to follow. Okay? Right. And this, of course, you know, once again, the title of this is Baal is the Catholic God. Absolutely. This is a very important point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People understand that this is who we're talking about here now. And this I, was not, I was not denying the importance of the point, but just reading 50 points for myself is something a little bit long. But when we do it like this, it will be very interesting. And uh, uh, we can always hold at one point because you are reading the second one. So when you want to do some more explanation to the points just read, then you can do that right away at that moment when I stop uh, when okay. I'm reading. Okay. All right. Okay. Doctrines of the Pagan Sun Gods, read by Jörg Lisbon, and Doctrines of the Catholic Church, read by Michael Adams. <laughs> First point. The Nativity of the Sun, the birth of Tammuz, December 25th. The doctrine of the Catholic Church says the Nativity of Jesus, or Christ Mass, see index, is held on December 25th. The Midsummer Festival of the Pagan was held on June 24th of each year. And then for the Catholics, their doctrine, the Nativity of St. John is held every year on June 24th. The Pagans <laughs> have the assumption of Semiramis, uh, who became the mother goddess of all pagans. And then for the Catholic side, it says, the Assumption of Mary, who became the Mother of God, the index to all Catholics. The Mother Goddess was given the title and worshipped as the Queen of Heaven, Jeremiah 7, verse 18. And then the Catholic side, Virgin Mary, is given the title and worshipped as Queen of Heaven by all Catholics. The pagan state... Queen of Heaven is wrath subduer of the pagan god. <laughs> uh, Mary, the Queen of Heaven, subdues her wrath of Christ and his father against sinners. The pagans teach cakes decorated to the goddess with an A plus drawn on it. Uh, even written in Jeremiah uh, 44 verses 17 and 19. Yeah, I think the plus is actually means a cross. Cross, yeah, that's possible, yeah, a cross. Yeah. And then, of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, we have holy <clears throat> cross buns are baked for Mary in most Roman Catholic churches. Forty days fasting before Easter for Thomas. And the Catholics fast 40 days Lent before Easter. <laughs> Gee, do you think we're actually witnessing the same religion here? Is it talking about the same religion? <laughs> uh, I think there are some similarities. Oh, yeah. The sexual festival of Easter, as in Ezekiel 8, 16. Well, okay, and the Roman Catholic Church initiated the sexual festival of Easter first in Christendom. The pagans have a gathering at sunrise for worship. Uh, uh, the Catholic Church started Easter sunrise service first in Christendom. The resurrection of Tammuz on Easter and the procession of graven images during Easter Holy Week is a pagan doctrine. All Roman Catholic churches parade, partake in uh, processions of graven images of Jesus, Mary, and Peter and other saints during Easter week. Veneration of graven images of Baal, Ishtar, Tammuz, and lesser gods in the heavens. Our Roman Catholic churches venerate gra graven images of Jesus, Mary, Peter, and of lesser saints in the heavens. <clears throat> the belief of the constant immortality of the soul and burning place of the eternal torment of pain belief. 
that Rome, Rome teaches the belief of immortality of the soul, see index, and of a burning place of eternal torment, see index. I don't think that you always have to read see index. <laughs> it's just where you want to go deeper okay. into that. But it's, it's all documented on this site. That's why he states earlier that he has more than 20,000 documents to sustain his, uh, his points here. So yeah. uh, we, we, we can just leave it at the points, you know, um, just not to confuse our listeners here. Pagans believe in the doctrine of purgatory. Uh, Rome teaches the doctrine of purgatory. The belief of the dead visiting the living on a certain day each year. A feast is then held for all the dead on first day of November, called All Souls Day. And the Rome, Rome teaches they must hold a festival for the dead on All Saints Day held November 2nd. And All Saints Day held November 1st each year. Yeah. And just think of Halloween. Yeah. Burning incense and candles, as in Jeremiah 11.17 and Ezekiel 8.11. Rome, as well as every satanic church, burns incense and candles in their masses. Pagans chant and repetitive prayers. Bedded prayers chains. And Rome, as well as Satanists, use chants and the beaded prayer chains. Rome calls the chant Gregorian chants and the beaded chained rosary. The symbol of the cross as symbol of sun worship. Mesopotamian cylinder seals of old have been found that depicted the cross in the sky as a symbol of sun worship. Ancient carvings of an Assyrian, uh, of an Assyrian king have also had huge crosses carved on their chest. The oldest pictures in the world from Mesopotamia has text with it explaining the cross in the sky as the symbol for the sun. This particular archaeological find is on display at the University Museum Crosses as well in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Well, I know one thing. It's absolutely amazing how the pagan Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, has corrupted Christianity. The Roman Catholic Church displays a plus sign or cross symbol not only on the walls, paintings, windows, and roofs of their churches, their priests also have these crosses on their clothing. Many other churches also use them and even place them inside a circle as a double symbol of Baal. The crucifix itself is an elongated version of the cross of Baal as well. Did you know that, folks? Once again, the crucifix itself is a, an elongated version of the cross of Baal. Pagan Rome of old offered human sacrifices to Baal on these. Well, Michael, that is the reason why they nailed Jesus to a cross and not just to a tree or whatever because they nailed him to the sun god. Yeah. Pagans were amulets and idols to scare away evil spirits. Roman Catholicism teaches the wearing of crucifix and, and medals as a method of protection. The uh, so scapulature is proof of that fact. The round disc sun wafer with the IHS symbol for Isis, Horus, and Seth, was eaten as food for the soul and worshipped as Baal incarnate. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church ex uh, Eucharist wafer also has the IHS carving on its for Isis, Horus, Seb, and he spelled S E B. <clears throat> And it is also given as food for the soul and is worshipped as God incarnate. Do you see any similarities here? Or? Oh, not, not me. <laughs> <laughs> it's disgusting. The more, more you read this, the more it's just like, yeah. good grief, how can anybody buy into any of this stuff? <clears throat> just, oh. Makes you sick, doesn't it? It does. It makes me, I have a lot of empathy and compassion for those who are in, in the, these churches. And we're only at point 0.19. There are still 34 or something to come. Yeah. 
Pagans would paint the child Tammuz and his mother Semiramis with the glory of the sun around their heads. Rome paints the child Jesus and his mother Mary with halos of the sun around their heads. Pagans performed infant baptism and the sprinkling of holy water. <clears throat> Roman pra Rome practiced infant baptism as well as sprinkling of holy water. Pagans taught necromancy, which is talking to the dead. <clears throat> Rome teaches mysticism, along with necromancy, by the way. I just put that in there. Uh, and no, no, Venice? Novena, Novenas. Novenas, prayers for the dead. And the, yeah. And by the way, you can find that necromancy is practiced in the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. Yeah, absolutely. And I have uh, hundreds of pictures sent to me by Guy Caballero about this necromancy and about uh, churches uh, even built of whole bones and skeletons and uh, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, among others, uh, can you, can you having think a skull in their hands and all that stuff. Yeah. Can you think what possesses a man or men and women to create a whole cathedral out of bones and skulls? You have to be out of your freaking mind to even do that. Mm -hmm. And this one can be visited, I think, in the Czech Republic today. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about wickedness. So. Yeah, absolutely. The first day of the week kept sacred to honor the Persian sun god Mithra. The name of the day was changed to Sun Day. Rome admitted they changed the Sabbath from uh, Sabbath day seven to the day one in honor of Sunday. So they changed. Yeah, that's good. As you said, they changed this. They changed the day, the seventh day, from the seventh day to the to day one in honor of the Sunday. So in other words, Sunday yeah. now is day one of the week. Constantine did that in 321 for all the people living in cities at that time. Just the peasants were taken out at that moment. They still could worship on uh, Saturday. Later on, that was also abolished. Right. The title Pontifex Maximus was given to the chief head of the pagan Babylonian system of idolatry. <laughs> and the title Pontifex Maximus is the main title of the popes of Rome. Pagan gods, Janus and Sibylle, were believed to be holders of the keys to heaven and hell. The Pope claims to have the keys of Peter within his clutches. The highest pagan priest kings was carried <clears throat> uh, on a throne to the temple of his god in special ceremony. And the, the Pope is carried on a portable throne to the Basilica of St. Peter's. And Sedea... Gastroia and special ceremony. The pagan high priest king is believed to be the incarnate of the sun god. The Pope claims to be Jesus Christ in the flesh on earth. See index. <laughs> um, pagans are thought to perform offerings of good works to appease the gods. I just you know the one I just read there. Then of course we did the little uh, little show, uh, sixteen minute plus show on Saturday about the Pope running away from the tsunami and pretending <laughs> and he's claiming to be Jesus Christ and in flesh on earth. You think he could have done something about any of that? But I guess he didn't. He just left his followers to stranded in a tsunami. Catholics are required to do penance, purchase indulgences, perform many good works to gain salvation. Pagans had special, special houses for the virgin priestesses to be employed as pagan temples. Some of these women were used as prostitutes for the heterosexual priests. Okay, folks. Now, remember what he just read there. Roman Catholic <laughs> Church has nuns. <laughs> And many of them end up being prostitutes for the priests. If they find a heterosexual priest, at least. Yeah, well, you know. 
Pagan often had human sacrifices burned by fire as an offering to appease the sun god. Many millions of uh, opposers of Roman Catholic doctrine were burnt at the stake. Pagans believed that gold was the flesh of the sun god and would fill their temples of worship with as much as possible. The Vatican is literally drenched in gold throughout, as are numerous cathedrals the world over. Pagans often placed stone carvings of gargoyles upon their roof as a pagan god of protection. The Vatican is well known, as well as thousands of Catholic churches across the globe have gargoyles on their roofs. Also, they also have uh, Darth Vader as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, did, did you remember? Did I send that to you? The picture of the the one cathedral in Washington D.C. that has uh, the head of Darth Vader as one I don't, of the I don't, I don't remember that. But all, uh, all, <laughs> always when talking about gargoyles, uh, I have been uh, four times in my life in Paris, uh, and Paris is the sister city of Rome. You have to know. Wow. Uh, and there I visited um, the. Uh, cathedral or whatever you're going to call it, Notre Dame. Notre Dame. The one that the Knights Templar, um, what was his name? Um, I don't know. He was, he was burned at the stake. And he oh, asked... What? Uh, uh, Demolay? Yeah, Demolay, yeah. Right, yeah. right. And he asked to be burned in that way that he can have a look at Notre Dame because Notre Dame was built by the Knights Templars. And when I visited that church, you can go up on the roof and you see all the gargoyles right in front of you. And even on the side, it has the battle mat. And when uh, de Molay was burned, he wanted to face battle mat. But I always ask myself when I visited this church, what are all these monsters are doing out here? I mean flying dragons and, and, and real monsters, gargoyles, as I said here. I always wondered about that. I don't wonder, of course, not today anymore, and I don't go to Paris anymore, but I have been there four or five times in my life, and I wondered really about that in, uh, on Notre Dame. Mm. Phallic symbol for the male sex organ were placed on the roofs or in courtyards of pagan temples. Hey, it sounds, it sounds <laughs> like the church down the street. Hey. <laughs> Just look at the steeple. Yeah. Uh, the Vatican has the largest phallic symbol in the middle of St. Peter's Square, plus all Roman Catholic churches have them on their roofs today. Uh, we call them steeples. Oh, I haven't read that with the steeples. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, you know, as far as the Vatican having the largest phallic symbol, uh, uh, Walt's steeple from... Um, uh, no, no, he was, uh, Walt was talking about the largest um, obelisk obelisk in the world. And that turns out not to be in Washington, D.C. No, no, never, he never said that that was the one on St. Peter's Square. He always said that was the Washington Monument. Oh, I know that. I know that. I wasn't going to say that. I was going to say that, that the largest one has actually we discovered is so far is actually in all places Texas. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, not, and not the Washington Monument. But the Washington Monument has some other interesting figures. Uh, do you know them? Uh, as far as the Washington Monument, it has, you talked about the, uh, the... The measurements. Oh, yeah, yeah, because they're... They, they it have is 555, uh, 555 feet high, and it is 55.5 feet wide, and 55.5 five feet in the, uh, in, in, uh, in the length. So when you add that to the 555 in the length, and then you take the, uh, the other two, 55 and a half and 55 and a half, you come to the number of 666. Right. Yep. Yeah. And that's Washington Monument. <clears throat> but okay, continuing. Number 32 we have already. The solar wheel is a symbol for Baal and was given reverence by the pagans of old. This wheel can be found carved into ancient as well as modern Buddhist temples and carved into ancient ornamental form representing Osiris. St. Peter's Square has the largest solar wheel on the planet. All Catholic churches have numerous solar wheels and stained glass windows as well as many other areas of the church, Notre Dame Cathedral and Paris 
sports a huge one on its face. There is a great one in the ceiling as well as the floor tiles of the monastery of St. Ignatius Loyola in Spain. Numerous paintings, statues, ornaments, letterheads, all the Catholic churches have one or more solar wheels depicted upon them and one world and the one world church that started on June 26, 2000 uses a solar wheel as its official logo on their letterhead. And I want to make a comment too. If we look at the U United Nations city that's building is being built in Copenhagen, the main building there is a solar wheel, at least the spokes of it. So um, there you go. That actually might end up being the largest solar wheel on the planet when it's all said and done, surpassing, mm -hmm. surpassing the one in the Basilica Square. So, Okay. Are you going to make a note? I'm going to make a note, too. Okay. Um, in the South Reich, the Nazis had in their flag the, um, uh, how do you call that cross, um, the uh, swastika. Yeah. And the swastika is nothing else than a sun symbol, sun, yep. uh, sun wheel symbol of old, of course. Uh, so there you see <laughs> the Catholic connection of the Nazis and, of course, with the Roman Church, because Hitler was a Roman Catholic. For people who didn't know that, yeah. You mean he wasn't a Jew? <laughs> no, 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 no. He was. He was not an abandoned son of Rothschild. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's going to root a lot of people's theories right there. Oh my goodness. Well, yeah, they wouldn't <laughs> like it when we, when we don't bash the Jews, right? <laughs> Uh, but there must be some kind of Jewish connection, by the way, since we're diverting a little bit here. Um, when you look at the uh, Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, you have six Roman Catholics and three Jews, mm -hmm. which are probably Tomatic Jews anyways, Kabbalists in nature. There's strong, there, there, there probably is, there has to be a very strong connection at this point with the, the uh, papal hierarchy and this... Uh, Tomatic Jews, and uh, I'm not saying necessarily that they run the whole show, but they're certainly part of it, and I think they're more than just a front men. They're more than just front men at this point. I don't know exactly, and, but if we look at the connection with Babylon and the Tomatic Jews and who, where they came out of, it's logical. You know, if you look at Simon's Magus, Magnus, who was, you know, supposedly the first, quote unquote, you know, bishop of this this Roman Church that we now know of as Roman Catholicism? Um, there's a strong connection with them, and uh, I'm not trying to say go let's go bash the Jews. I'm just saying there's a group of people who call themselves Jews, which are not. They're all part of the synagogue of Satan. They are all part of it. Of course, like all the Jews that work together with the Jesuits, they are betraying their own, their own people for their own gain. Sure. Just okay. as... Just I, I, don't, don't let us start on that subject, because from that subject we go into uh, the Israel of today. Okay. I know where in the Bible it is written <laughs> that there will be a Israel of today that is only to fit the counterfeit uh, Daniel 70th week. Yeah. Uh, and the futurism teaching of Alcazar and um, uh, Bellarmine and um, uh, Rivera in that time. So let's not go there because that is at least one other broadcast that we can otherwise go into. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Nevertheless, nevertheless, but it would really go out of proportion on this broadcast today. So right. but that's an interesting point that you are making there, of course, that also a lot of people who call themselves Jews sometimes should check who they are following, who they are running after, and maybe come to their senses and pick up the Bible. Because when the Jews say, I only believe in the Torah, I only believe in the Old Testament, well, in the Old Testament, on numerous places, it is written that Jesus will come, and there is certainly written the way that Jesus would come, like we did on other broadcasts, and like we did, um, like Tom did with the explanation of Daniel 70's week, that there was no doubt for people who studied the Torah, which is the Old Testament, to know when Jesus Christ came. 
So there is no need to wait for another Jesus to come now in the future. Let's no. just finish this with that. Absolutely. So check, they should check who they run after and what they believe. Yes. But they also yes. rather follow the Talmudic teaching, which is man teaching and not the teaching of God, of the Old Testament. Correct. Um, let's go to number 33. Archaeologists have found numerous carvings of the serpent on pagan Rome bathhouses. The symbol of the serpent can also be found in numerous Catholic churches in door handles, papal crusts, etc. Pagans have depicted Atlas as carrying the universe on his shoulders. They would place a large globe upon his shoulders. <laughs> the UN. Uh, numerous popes have been depicted in paintings in the exact same manner. There are also some paintings on statues of Mary doing the same. Pagans used the symbols of the unicorn, peacock, and phoenix to signify some of their sun gods. The symbols of the unicorn, peacock, and phoenix used to symbolize the communion of Christ are found carved in gold in many churches on doors and chapels as well as the small sanctuary buildings housing the Eucharist or wafer of God of Rome. Mm -hmm. Crescent moon used to signify moon goddess Nana was depicted in numerous paintings, etchings, carvings, and statues. It was also used to cradle the sun god in wafer form before the people for worship. And the crescent is also used to cradle Eucharist in the monstrance of the Roman Catholic Church and is paraded before the people for worship. It is also seen in countless paintings, etchings, carvings, and sculptures. The three letters SFS within a small blaze was used to represent the universal mystery for the number six in the pagan mysteries. An SFS is in a small blaze is boldly carved into the Vatican monstrous for all to see in the Vatican Museum as well as many monstrance in the churches worldwide, world over, excuse me. Alternating rays of the sunburst used to represent unity of man and woman, common in all aspects of paganism. Curved ray is the female yonix, and straight ray is the, fa is the male phallic. The monsters of, the, of Catholicism, as well as many paintings and sculptures, all depict same rays of both the phallic and yonic symbols can be found literally in all over the Roman Catholic churches. Just think of the emblem of the uh, Jesuits. The Jesuits yep. unburst. It's all over. Yeah. Carvings of nature spirits, fauns or satires depicting a horned, hoofed god were a common feature in all pagan churches. Carvings of nature spirits, bonds and satars, depicting a horn hoofed god are found all over the treasury of the Vatican beneath St. Peter's Square as well as many cathedrals around the world. The statues of Madonna, or My Lady, can be found in all pagan churches, as well as the Egyptian Madonna, Isis, with her son Horus, or Hindu churches with Divaki and her son Krishna. Mm -hmm. Mary is found in all Catholic churches holding baby Jesus wearing the same clothing, as well as Jesus making the same hand signals. You know, we're talking about Madonna, though. It reminds me of the singer and performer of Madonna that's been pushed on us, and I imagine you as well, in Europe, but the I queen don't... of the Illuminati. Yeah, isn't that interesting? The queen, the the queen of the Illuminati music industry. That is Madonna. Yeah. Which have you know, pagan Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. That she would be the one pushed on us so much as kids growing up. It's just an absolute travesty when you realize who's been actually pushing them, pushing her. You know, she was, you know, it wasn't, you know, if anybody thinks it was because of her great talent and her great business skills, 
I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but a friend of mine every year goes to a big music festival here in the neighborhood. It's called Vashda. It's one of the biggest music festivals uh, world around. And one year, Madonna was there to perform. And she was booed away by the public because, she, hey, she maybe looks good, but she can't sing. <laughs> and in that live performance, everything, everything was made clear to the people. She cannot sing. But she can perform a show, of course, an Illuminati show. Just look at her appearance at the Super Bowl some years ago. Oh, yeah. And that pagan symbolism in there. I mean, if you can stand it, when I see it, uh, always I get sick too much. It's very perverse. But, you know, the interesting thing is, is that she's another icon, an image, um, an idol that they have created. She, they created her. She didn't create herself. They created her. They being the Jesuits, they being Rome, the pagan Roman Empire that you and I live under. They create all these idols in the music and film industry. Yeah. yeah. And we were talking about that, you know, when we were saying um, this was about uh, in, the, uh, in the late 60s and begin 70s, it was about uh, homosexuality. Uh, you had to be homosexual and to get raped by the producers and everything to get a name there uh, in the 50s and the years there before you had the so-called producer's couch and from the mid 70s and begin early 80s on uh, it is all about witchcraft yeah. and that's, that's what it's all about and, and when, you, when you watch some documentaries like uh, they sold their souls for rock and roll and when you follow uh, some uh, people on the internet like uh, the vigilant christian and channels like these um, they will always tell you about the Illuminati influence in the music and movie industry. And there it is absolutely there in plain sight. And that is how they make these idols for the people. And then you have this example like Kesha when she makes song Dying Young and Young and everyone is around that. And of course, uh, you don't need to wonder anymore why so many young people commit suicide anymore. It's all indoctrination from the Illuminati. But uh, we are again... Um, going away from the subject here. But, uh, but Illuminati, as we, as we know, the Illuminati is the, is, is the Jesuits. They're controlled by the Jesuits and yeah. by Rome. So. There's a very interesting article that we can go through uh, to, to read that. Uh, I found that a day or two ago about, um, no, not an, not an article, but a comment that somebody made on a video. Uh, he is, uh, his name is B.G. Separate, and I'm uh, sub to him. He has a very, very nice channel of uh, Christian teaching. Be ye separate, uh, if you want to sub him on YouTube. Very, very good channel. And he made a wonderful, wonderful statement because there was, um, I made a comment and uh, another one made a comment beneath it and said, yeah, we you know the Jews did 9-11. And um, he made a wonderful comment extending about 250 lines that he wrote the connection of Adam Weishaupt and the founding of the Illuminati connected to the Jesuits, uh, citing different books and all that stuff. Very, very interesting. Remind me on that, Michael, and we should deal with that in another broadcast. Okay. Very interesting. But now I'm going to continue with um, point 41, how the pagans um, uh, worshipped in that time. So we see in point 41, the statue of Zeus, Hold, sim, holds a symbol of thunder and the lightning bolt. Pagans taught symbolized his position as a god. Mary has been depicted in many statues in the same manner all throughout the Vatican as well as in many churches. Pagans have demigods holding crooked di uh, diving staffs that represent the serpent as well as the lightning bolt. The Pope himself carries the exact same staff today, serpent uh, uh, crozier, uh, crozier, yeah. crozier. Is that how it's pronounced? Crozier. Yeah, I think it's French. Okay, he is f photographed often with it as well. That's for sure. Yeah, and he has the bent cross. Yep. Also, a um, old pagan <clears throat> satanic symbol. Mm -hmm. In pagan Rome, you would find Adat, Enlil, Baal, Neptune, Poseidon, and other gods of storm and sea being depicted as carrying tridents in their hands. <laughs> Crosses as well as 
statues of Jesus, Mary, in cathedrals all over the world carved with tridents on them. There, are even a gold, there is even a gold statue of baby Jesus in the Vatican with three tridents coming out of his head. <laughs> All three tridents also depict the phallic and yonic symbolism as well as that statue. They even carved the forks to, to make that fact known. Hmm. Incredible. Yes. Yeah. Hand gestures in the form of the tridents can be found depicted in pagan gods such as Jupiter, Buddha, Apollo, and Hindu deities as well. They are called votive hands in pagan temples. A statue of St. Peter, originally the old Jupiter statue of Rome, as well as millions of other statues, paintings, photos, and videos often, excuse me, of every one from Jesus and Mary to priests, cardinals, bishops, all the popes, Vatican guards, and even lay people themselves in the Catholic Church can be seen holding up the three-finger trident salute of the pagan Rome, of pagan Rome, now called the salute of the Trinity. Huh. Interesting. And the Trinity, of course, is false Roman Catholic teaching. Mm-hmm. Pine cones. Well, what well, the word that I didn't come to earlier in this <laughs> in this broadcast. Pine cones used to represent the deity of a solar god Osiris, Bacchus, Dionysus, uh, Dionysus, as well as Mexican gods, Hindu gods, and Assyrian gods can be found all throughout pagan Rome. The largest pine cone sculpture in the world is found in the court of the pine cone at the Vatican. The pine cone is also found carved into the crooked pagan staff, serpent, uh, how do you say that again? Crozier? Serpent, serpent crozier. Crozier. Serpent crozier, if I can ever remember that. Serpent crozier of the popes of Rome. In fact, the pine cone is found all throughout the Vatican as well as cathedrals as a decoration. The staff of the pope holds with the deformed Jesus and crooked cross on it has a pine cone under the base of the cross. I didn't know that one. Hmm. Didn't know about the pine cone. I knew about the cross. <laughs> yeah, we're still learning, aren't we? Yeah. Owen, the Babylonian fish god, half man and half fish, was depicted by pagan high priests by wearing a fish head mitre, head dress, upon a man's head to symbolize men and fish joining. <laughs> Miters or headdresses that are worn oh, by all. Sorry, it continues here on the next oh. page. <laughs> sorry. Uh, <clears throat> upon a man's head to symbolize man and fish joining when the sun god set into the ocean. Neptune, case in point, half man, half fish. One particular biblical deity that confirms this is Dagon, found in 1st Samuel. Dag, fish on sun. <laughs> Okay, miters and headdresses that are worn by all popes of Catholicism are an exact duplicate of these Dagon headdresses. Yeah, the one that I put on the plane on the video of the fleeing pope. When you <laughs> <laughs> the Roman sun god faced with the alternate, alternating ionic and phallic symbols surrounding his head was found carved in excavated Roman bathhouses in England. It is also found as Apollo on the face of the Pergamum Museum in East Berlin. Hmm. Almost all Catholic churches have the exact same carvings above their pulpits, pillars, and statues, as well as carved into ceilings above altars. Some Catholic churches exactly have it carved into the Eucharist itself. There is also a statue in Rome of Mary cradling the face within the a blaze in her arms as well excuse me in her arms as if he is her child plus many weather reporters really use this face inside a solar blaze or blaze as a graphic 
for their uh, weather reports. Huh. I didn't really realize that. Well, that's because you and I do not watch much television. Statues of the Romanized Egyptians Isis with globes in her hand, Hercules, as a solar deity, carried the, same, uh, the very same globe in his hand. And the Persian sun god Mithra is also depicted with a globe in his hand as a sign he is the ruler of the universe. <laughs> the Vatican has a solid gold statue of Jesus with the globe in hand, a black marble statue called the Black Virgin of Montserrat. Montserrat, thank you, and the statue of a uh, child Jesus with globe in hand, as well as countless other statues all over the world with Mary and others holding the globe. Coptic shells were carved to symbolize the universe as well. Roman gravestones used them to represent the heavens. Statues of Atlas can be found carrying the universe shell upon its shoulders. Pagan Rome carved Poseidon with the shell as part of his head. Venus was said to be born from, in, uh, from within a Coptic shell. St. <laughs> Peter's Basilica in, in the Vatican has this pagan symbol within the papal crest upon the wall. The Coptic shell is also found over the crypt of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. This cosmic symbol is often used as a font for holding holy water, excuse me, a fount for holding holy water in Catholic churches the world over. They even have statues of angels holding this pagan symbol filled with holy water. And um, one very interesting remark, and this is um, the Dutch oil company Shell, Dutch Shell, and their Shell symbol, which is sun worship symbol. If you don't know, I, I don't know, you don't have uh, Dutch Shell over there in the United States, right? Yeah, oh yeah, we do. Oh, you do? Okay. Uh, we have this uh, many times here in Europe, of course. And, uh, it's, I sometimes it's not as big as it used to be. It used to be very prominent, at least in my neck of the woods. But. Yeah. Okay. The large evil eye can be found carved on a Roman sarcophagus in the National Archaeological Museum in Rome, Italy. Masonic pendants have them as well. Hathor, the eye of Osiris, can be found all over Egyptian temples. It was commonly used as protection against evil magic. I like this one. Um, mm -hmm. This very evil eye within the pyramid is found on Roman Catholic pulpits, ceilings, altars, doors, um, pendants, medals, etc. It is also on the back of a dollar bill of the U.S. on the left side, floating above the unfinished pyramid. Yes, it is that all-seeing eye, the eye of Horus, the evil eye. But they've been trying to tell us has means something other than the fact that the papacy. I, I feel are, that it it means the papacy rules. It dominates. Whatever you find that that means the papacy runs the show. You'll find okay. it in most. Well, it's actually well. It's the all. Oh, it's the papal C. It's papal S E E. That's what it is. The papal C. It's their, if you will, their stamp. It says we own this. Now you'll find it on the Mormon temples. You'll find it all over the place. Not just dollar bills and in their own churches, but in, in their own cathedrals, but everywhere in the, in stadiums, um, in all sorts of buildings, banks, etc. Different religions. It's everywhere, and I strongly believe that that's what it's saying. It's saying that uh, Rome runs this joint. So. <laughs> Others will say otherwise, but I've come to that realization. So, no, I do not think that you are wrong there in any way. So. Now going on to point 51 of the pagan worship uh, symbols. The multi-level crown of the high pagan priest was first worn by old Babylonian gods in 1800 BC. The horned tiara was carved atop Assyrian wine god bull cherubims as well. Uh, sorry, uh, atop Assyrian winged bull cherubims as well. The Jewish Kabbalistic solar deity wore this very same tiara as did Krishna. 
Interesting. Interesting. The Jewish Kabbalah, Kabbalistic solar deity wore the very same tiara. Hmm. Uh, the bronze tomb of Pope uh, Sixtus depicts his dead body in bronze with this three-ring tiara on his head. On that tiara, he can also see, excuse me, you can also see six serpents upon it. All the popes have worn the tiara as a symbol of their authority as gods on the earth, heaven and hell. Hence, the three rings upon it. The Vatican has a solid gold tiara on display in the Vatican treasury at all times. This is the very crown the Pope will hand to Antichrist when he arrives to impersonate Jesus in the day as days ahead. Hmm. Yeah, probably when he is giving that to him on I don't know, the to rebuild Temple Mount when, we, <laughs> when the final Antichrist is coming. The fake Jesus for everybody to see because the one that we are exposing today is not one everybody sees. That's why we have to do these characteristics of Antichrist. Right. Anyway, point 52. Quetzalcoatl, the lord of life and death in the Aztec and Toltec cultures of 1000 AD, had an opened chest with an exposed heart displayed in his statues. This was believed to be nourishment offered to the sun gods. Hmm. Seems like all these these religions like to have their sacrifices. Literally hundreds of thousands of statues, paintings, posters, lithographs, rings, medals, and icons have Jesus as well as Mary depicted in the exact same manner with what the Catholic Church calls the Sacred Heart. Notice that these Sacred Hearts also have the symbols of the Sun God Mithra, glowing rather boldly behind them at all times. And the last point <clears throat> of pagan worship symbols is that uh, Assyrian carvings show eagles as genies hovering over the dead. Their Book of the Dead depicts just such a picture on its cover. And the eagles are used as symbols all over the Roman Catholic Church. See Revelations 18.2, for it speaks of the Vatican as the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And by the way, at the Vatican, you'll see all sorts of carvings and paintings of unclean birds. And also, eagle is a famous Roman symbol for the past 2,500 years. <clears throat> That's why a lot of nations also have the eagle as emblem, like uh, the German Reich had that for ages, the United States of America has that on their seal, and a lot of other countries have the eagle in their seal, also the Vatican, that is why. So now we just have to finish and ask our questions one question to end this broadcast. <laughs> now, do you understand why the Vatican is declared the whore of Babylon? No, I can't get, figure it out at all. <laughs> okay, then you're going to start at you. <laughs> I just can't see how you could say that. <laughs> you got to be just too bigoted and, you know, man, you must really hate the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> well, that's what, you, that's what usually people think and say, but, you know, as you point out the obvious truth, and you know, it just becomes overwhelmingly clear that, Rome, Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican there in all Vatican City really is the whore of Babylon. No matter what uh, the Roman Catholics and their sympathizers try to say, and they'll try to tell you that it's somewhere in the Middle East, or it's Jerusalem, or it's Washington, D.C., or it's New York. They'll try to tell you all sorts of places, but... The overwhelming prophetic, biblical, and historical evidence is, is that the Vatican is the whore of Babylon. That's right. Now, I'm just going to go back to the question that the guest posted earlier there, about um, just to answer that, uh, about this uh, television series that I mentioned before. Uh, is that guest still on? I don't know. Guest 7? I watched the entire series of Breaking Bad only on your guest's 
a recommendation. Sorry, it was not a recommendation, it was more a warning. <laughs> While I enjoyed it immensely, I don't remember why he said to watch it. Okay, guest uh, seven, uh, here comes your answer again. Um, I mentioned that television series because in the television series, Hollywood depicts a man that turns from a positive uh, person, he was a high school teacher in chemistry, into a very bad criminal. And the point is not that he turned into a criminal and his uh, reasons for doing that. The point is that throughout the whole series, the watcher of, the, of that series is to be feeling positive feelings for this person, to empathize with this person, to accept all the reasons why he is doing all that bad stuff in his life. He, at the end of the series, killed, has killed more than 20 people. I didn't count them all, but it's about that, at least. And um, you, as uh, a watcher of this series, are going to sympathize with this guy. And that wrong teaching where good is bad, uh, where, where good is portrayed as bad because his brother-in-law, who was a DEA agent, was more um, shown as a bad person because he was after him without knowing that it was him. Otherwise, he would have gotten him earlier. But the point was, he was searching for the bad guys and he was more depicted as a bad person. He was more antipathetic than the sympathetic uh, meth cook teacher that the other guy turned into. And this deception uh, showing you that white is black and black is white and good is bad and bad is good. And um, that was what I was warning about. And that is what this uh, Jesuitical spiritual formation does through the media with everyone that watches these television series or kind of movies. So I think now I've explained it uh, enough. So <laughs> yeah, you did sympathize with Walter White. And, and that, that's all right, because they do it for that that you do it. If you wouldn't sympathize with Walter White, you would never watch the series, you know? You would never go through five seasons of that. But you sympathize with them. You even identify with them. I mean, not, maybe not you personally, but a lot of people who watch them said, Oh, well, cooking math, that's not such a bad stuff. Well, it kills people. Huh? And when you see some of the, uh, some of the addicts in that, uh, in that series, I mean, uh, you can get nightmares of that when you look in the, in the teeth. You know, that scene, um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into that right now. But, you know, it's where they really use this false teaching and let you sympathize with the false things. And in that way, by showing not only this series, but also a lot of other series that do just the same thing, they are changing the morals, the morals of the society. And then comes the day when everybody will see good as bad and bad as good because they portray it that way. And that's the way they brainwash and indoctrinate people. And that's why I warned you of that series. Warned in a way that I say, watch it to learn, but don't watch it to be entertained. Mm. That's very okay. good. Yeah. Also, you got to look at, too, it's about predictive programming as well and how that, like, so much of this worthless stuff that they, they offer us, you know, as the economy was going down the tubes in this country, they offer a show like this of a guy who was a school teacher who ends up being a, you know, cooking out crystal meth and becoming a drug dealer. And, you know, what they're doing, instead of offering solutions to your problem, to our problem, they're offering more and more ways to enslave you morally, corrupt you, that cause you to be despairing, that cause you to have no hope in your situation that they have created themselves. They being, well, we live in a Roman culture, we live in a part of the Roman Empire, the they would be Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, the um, the Jesuits, all those who are actually controlling the media, that have been known for controlling the media for now for hundreds of years, 
Although most people think the Jews actually control it. But, you know, that's because most people don't really spend a lot of time really researching who actually controls it. <laughs> so <laughs> they just accept the first thing that they hear. But the truth of the matter is, Rome has been corrupting your mind for a reason. And that reason is because, well, what they want to do, who they actually serve. They serve the, they serve the, the dragon. They serve Satan. And, and uh, their whole purpose in life is, uh, it's all designed to be an enmity with God. They're at war with God. They're at, with, at war with God's people, God's children. And the whole idea here is to corrupt more and more of you. Now, they'll tell you it's about entertainment, but then you've got to look at what the word entertainment actually means. York, you do a good job of explaining what entertainment means. What does it actually mean? I'm sorry I didn't pay that much attention to what you were saying because I was, uh, I was answering here in the, in the chat. Entertainment. Board. What's the definition of entertainment again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, you, can, you only have to split that word up into, uh, into the three syllables that it's made from. Uh, that is enter to come in, uh, tame to keep in the uh, in in uh, mind of, uh, of possession, and meant, um, or to put in the mind of possession, uh, and to, meant means to keep that kind of possession. So that means that at the moment, and the moment you turn, um, you turn the television on, you are being entertained. Means you open the door for demons to come in, to hold you in the state of possession of mind control. Uh, you have to study that also with the brain waves because our brain waves are on a level of I think eight hertz, something like that. And then you have to see how that is, uh, how that is being distorted by the television. There are a lot of documentaries on this and a lot of things to find when you just Google it about the mental state of your brain when you watch television. And this just means that you are letting the demons come into you and take possession of you and, and possession of your mind. And that is why so many people are in apathy behind the television. That when your mother calls out of the kitchen, dinner is ready, you don't even hear that. Um, that you need um, the, uh, the ad break uh, when they place their advertisements over there just to run into the kitchen to get a new beer. They don't mind that you, uh, that you don't watch the advertisement, but you, you are kept in the state of possession in there when, when you watch television. And um, there's actually quite a very interesting quote um, that uh, I, I sometimes mention. I think this is from uh, Anton LaVey, who is the founder of, um, uh, of the Satanic Church. Um, I don't know if I can find that right here. But uh, entertainment means enter, to come in, tain, to possess, and meant in the state of... So you're kept in the state of possession when you get entertained. And uh, Anton LaVey, in his book, The Devil's Notebook, on page 86, made a very interesting quote and um, that goes like, uh, quote, television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion. I read this extra slowly that you can really get it. Television is the major mainstream infiltration for the new satanic religion religion. The television set or satanic family altar has grown more elaborate since the early 50s, from the tiny fuzzy screen to huge entertainment centers covering entire walls with several TV monitors. What started as an innocent respite from everyday life has become in itself, a replacement for real life for millions. A major religion of the masses. End quote. And I will put this quote into the chat box that you can read it for yourself because I think even when I read it twice, you maybe here and there have a little question. This is very interesting to read and very interesting to understand. And uh, some years ago, when I was still watching um, Alan Watt, who is a very fine researcher, I oh, didn't take the whole stuff that I put in there, uh, he mentioned that um, 
the beast, Alistair Crowley, he gave himself, uh, his mother gave him the name the beast, his mother called him the beast, Alistair Crowley, the Satanist, was involved in the inventing of television. So, trying to copy paste that again, I don't know why they take all of it here in the chat box, I'm sorry. Again, I'm now Sometimes, for some reason, sometimes it doesn't do that. I don't know why. Uh, <clears throat> up in the middle of the first uh, of the second sentence. Yes. So. And no. so there you, so there you go. Stop watching television. Also, start being really conscious and careful about what you're watching on the internet, because it's just as bad. It's designed just as much to deceive you and to manipulate you, to fool you. And there's an awful lot of videos out there that at first glance seem like they're actually teaching you the truth. They're not designed to do that. They're designed to either lead you down some rap, a bunny trail or some rabbit hole. But more, worse than that, it's designed to keep you trapped for an hour or two, actually getting nowhere in life, except maybe being full of the state of fear. And, uh, you know, I, I'm discovering, to be honest with you, Jorg, from my uh, own YouTube uh Surfing that I've done, and uh, is that how absolutely how, how much it sucks? I mean, it's just really most of it. I would say ninety percent of what's on the internet is junk too. Really is, and more and more as you learn and try to put the you start to put the the true picture together, what's really going on in your world, your life, in your world, you realize what's going on in the internet. Most of it is it's 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 not much better than the television. Really, it's not leading you to the truth. Well, you don't have to forget that the Internet was brought to us by the DOD, the Department of Defense. <laughs> um, it is just part of their strategy to create order out of chaos. Yeah. Ordo ab cao, as written on your $1 bill. Under the, what uh, Michael already mentioned, this... Um, I, I can't copy that here. I even refreshed the pages and still doesn't do it. Uh, doesn't do it completely. So sorry. If you want to have the whole quote, uh, just go to my channel, Juggler66, and send me an email and uh, a personal message, and then I will send you the quote if you need it. Otherwise, look it up on the internet. It's probably easy to find. Anton Lavey, the Devil's Notebook. I will just put that in here. But. Uh, the devil is in the details here today and uh, won't let me do it. So this is the quality. I'm guest nine now because I had to refresh the page. So, anyway, um, you have to uh, remember that um, the Department of Defense gave us the Internet. And why did they do it? Well, because they knew that not everybody uh, was going to stay on the mainstream media and believing them with all the lies they were bringing out for the last 20 years. So they needed an alternative. And the alternative to the mainstream media is, of course, the alternative media. What is the alternative media? Where can you find it? Well, they don't have that support financially to get books printed. I mean, books, okay, here and there you find them. But most of all, it's magazines or newspapers. And you know, to start a newspaper, you really need money. So, with the invention of the Internet, they had the possibility to start an alternative media and an alternative uh, movement to the mainstream movement. And that is the old system of Hegelian dialectic, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. So you have the mainstream on the one, you have the internet on the other, and then you have the synthesis, the controlled, complete controlled media as the outcome. Watch 1984, and you got where it all uh, goes to. Yep. Well, my friend, we probably ought to end this show, this recording, so it's uh, almost three hours, so... Um, yeah, but I loved every second of it, I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I did too. Uh, let's see, which is next seven. Anton Levy, uh, one of the world's best bands, 
or followers, Crowley, and went so far as to buy his home. That band was Led Zeppelin, uh, The Stairway to Heaven. That's true, and uh, the guitar player, uh, what's uh, Paige, he's the one that bought uh, Alistair Crowley's uh, mansion. And isn't it interesting how many of those guys, those uh, English heavy metal hard rock bands, uh, are Crowleyites? When you go into when you go into this oh, subject, yeah. you can go on for hours. Like on the on the most famous uh, Beatles album, there's also Alistair Crowley uh, with the picture on. Uh, I don't know if you know that. Yes. Uh, and Led Zeppelin, Led Zeppelin, when you play that backwards in the song, uh, is hailing to Satan. Yeah. The text. So there's just so much in that. I mean, when we go into there, we are still tomorrow here on the broadcast. Satanism is pervasive in the music scene, and it could go into. A, yeah, we could talk a lot about how they actually even conjure up and put evil spirits within these records or these CDs and uh, all sorts of things. But, you know, if you look at, uh, what's his name, Todd, Todd, whatever, uh, that one guy that said that he was a Satanist and part of the Illuminati. Um, John Todd, is that his name or something like that? But anyways, um, the fact of the matter is, is that music, they've known for a long time. Now I'm talking about the government that are all under Roman Roman control, run by Knights of Malta and uh, Knights of Columbus, aka Illuminati, <clears throat> with their front men, the Jews, have known for a long, long, long time that music is a tool for possession and has always been a tool for distraction and for mind control. And if you you can, you know, a really good book to to, uh, to read would be uh, uh, what's his name now? Uh, something about Laurel Canyon. Well, I think Weird Seeds of Laurel Canyon, and I can't remember his name offhand, but you can look up Weird Seeds of Laurel Canyon, and the connection. Uh, the 1960s. Now the CAA created all these groups, like the Doors. And all these big groups, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles. Oh yeah, I mean, and, and John yeah. Lennon. John Lennon said in an interview in the Star Club in Hamburg, where I'm from. I mean, it was a few years before I was born. I was born in '66, but he had an interview in '61 in the Star Club, before the Beatles really came into um, into big fame. And he stated in that interview, "I know that the Beatles will be the most successful music group all over the world because I sold my soul to Satan for it." Yeah, they all do. That's all yeah. part of the gig. Even when it's yeah, and that's why I, I, I say I, I, I'm not going to do a whole show about music and, and that stuff because I'm not too deep into that. I cannot keep all that stuff in my mind, but I can really, really advise you. Just tip into the Google search engine. They sold their souls for rock and roll. Um, that's an upload from, I think, um, Goods, uh, what's it called, Good Call Ministries or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he has a wonderful channel where he has all these videos uploaded, but be where uh, good, good Ministries Upload, I think this is his name. But be careful, he's a 501c3 organization. I'm going to give you that right along with it. But you can find a lot of this stuff on the Internet, and uh, doing a show on that, that was, would be too, exten too extensive. And it would not uh, really uh, work in our cause. That's why um, I, I would not really go into that. But um, well, you, I, only I, have to, you only have to see one major point. Lucifer, when he was in heaven, the created angel by God, he was the angel of music. He carried all the musical instruments. Is it a wonder that when he was cast down from heaven and called Satan here on the earth, that he used the same instruments that he used for the pleasure in heaven to indoctrinate the people on the earth into following him? No, not at all. So if you look at if you look at the two, like if you get a chance, so the guest seven said he was a roadie for the doors in nineteen sixty eight. Well, if he wants to tell something about that, that would be interesting. Then we can maybe do a show on that. But let's try to say something. Let's try to yeah. say something. <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Okay, 
So the doors, if you do, if you go get Dave McGowan's work and you look at uh, weird scenes of Laurel Canyon, you're going to find out some misery stuff that maybe you didn't even know about the doors. In particular, that uh, Jim Morrison was a uh, military brat that happened to also know all these other big name uh, rock and roll stars that all came out of this one place. They did not come out of San Francisco. They came out of Laurel Canyon. And it was a military uh, psychops, an operation via the CIA, which is another way of saying, you know, we call it the uh, Central Intelligence Agency, but uh, Tom Fresser friend would say it would be uh, Catholics in action, and I agree with them. And it was designed back then in the 60s, all that music that you and I grew up with and listened to and loved so much to keep us distracted not paying attention to what was really going on and to get people off the track was one thing was, you know, the protest against the Vietnam War. And as they have used that ever since as a way, as a tool to keep us from thinking. Music is brilliant at keeping you from thinking and staying in reality. It specifically has been worked on and designed just for that. And has led up to now when you're going to have the Super Bowl is coming up in a couple of weeks that Katy Perry, a self-proclaimed Satanist, along with Lenny Kravitz, who is whacked out New Age guy, who most likely is a, is a new, uh, Satanist as well, will be uh, offering us a Satanic ritual in the middle of the Super Bowl. And yes, Neil Young lived in Laurel Canyon, and yes, Neil Young was also a military brat, and Crosby, Nash, and Young were also all those guys were military brats were all created and supported by believe it or not the United States government and you thought that they just showed up because they had great talent <laughs> and I did too and I love their music but you know what now that what I do know I can never listen to it again because I know what it's really about and it's uh, it's all about mind control so and uh, yeah and then eventually it leads to Satanism and most it leads to people not knowing the true and living God and uh, rejecting it, you know. Absolutely. It's really tragic. So, yeah, we someday I would like to do uh, a, mus- uh, 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 do a show on the music scene because uh, I have done quite a bit of study on that, ex- being an ex-musician and um, being in bands and all that. It used to be a big part of my life. I was raised on MTV, so... I would, I would love to talk about that someday, but not today. I guess. But right now, we're going to end the show because it's almost three. So, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, and Jorg in particular, thank you for being part of the show. And, um, can I just uh, say a um, farewell sentence? Sure, you can. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, because you always close the show down, and I'm going to close my part right, down right now. So, I want to thank everybody who was in the chat room and uh, in the listening room and listening to our broadcast today and everybody who listens to this or downloads this and spreads this, I hope, all over the Internet and all over their family and their brethren uh, in the future because this world really needs to develop the characteristics of Antichrist because you have to know who your adversary is. Not only you have to find Jesus, but you, only have, you also have to see who his enemy is and to identify him because only when you can, when you know what the lie is, you can identify the truth in a very easy way. Uh, we will continue this broadcast, the characteristics of Antichrist, uh, one of these days, and Michael will announce it, of course, in, uh, on the main page of Nothing But The Truth. Uh, in the meantime, I just want to end with uh, one uh, little information. Nicholas from um, President of God Ministry, where we just read the document from, just uploaded uh, a new video for everybody who wants to see that, go to his website, uh, www.remnantofgod.org, or, uh, and uh, there you will find his latest video that he uploaded on uh, YouTube under the name Nicholas P.O.G.M., and that is called Muslims Hold Secret Meeting in Texas. What? <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm telling you. <laughs> I can send you the link directly, Michael, when we are done with this broadcast, but this is uh, some news that I wanted to end with. And um, as yeah. always, I think... Uh, well, 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 wait, wait, you can't just leave us hanging. <laughs> I haven't what? seen the video yet. Oh, okay, so. okay, you have to then. What's I just got the email that he uploaded itself. So. Oh, okay, so something was going on in Texas, the Muslims, so... 
Muslims hold secret meeting in Texas. Yeah, it, it, exactly there where the biggest uh, phallic symbol of the world, the biggest obelisk stands. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one thing. They didn't do a very good job of being secretive about it, if we know about it. So. <laughs> that's right. Anyway, okay. um, I, want, I, I, I want to thank anybody who, who listens here. And um, as we always say, we do not do this broadcast for our own sake, but we do that in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and with the help of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit who um, inspires us in finding these truths and reading them and explaining them to, to you all. And um, in the name of Jesus, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful broadcast and have a good night and see you later. Bye-bye. Thanks, York. Thanks, York, for uh, the opportunity to have this show. And um, for those who, who joined us, uh, thank you. And uh, for those who listen, thank you. And I uh, hope you get something out of this. And the most important thing you get out of this is to recognize who the Antichrist is, the characteristic of the Antichrist, and why we need to come out of her. And that it's not about being bigoted or prejudiced. It's about following God and his words. So, And... Uh, there is no answer in man-made religion. There is no hope in it. Only damnation. So, God bless you all. Have a good day. Bye-bye.